Um, we have uh, Senator Alex Claxton and Representative Tessa Bush here. So they're gonna make a presentation. We're gonna ask people to raise your hands if you have a question. We're gonna take one question at a time, one person from the audience, one person from Zoom. If you have the same question, we're gonna ask you to step back and have somebody ask a different question. We're gonna take Woodstock residents first because this is a Woodstock town meeting. Uh, and uh, three minutes at most to speak, depending on how late we're running. And with that. And we also ask if you wanna speak yeah. from the podium and speak from the podium to the microphone there. So everyone on Zoom will hear you as well. State your name and speak clearly, thank you. And don't worry if you forget, we'll remind you. Would you be able to use the microphone up there? It's very hard to hear. We don't have we don't have a microphone for the room, unfortunately. We'll try to shout. Speak louder, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, uh additions and deletions for the agenda. Uh we're trying to delete the financial reports uh with the act agenda. Uh select board has questions about it, please email me and I can get back. Uh, to you, or if any residents has any questions about the financial reports, uh, please email me, eduffy at townofwoodstock.org, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Okay. I skipped uh, citizens' comments. Melissa has nothing to do with tonight's guests. We'll listen to comments. Otherwise, Roger, why not? Um, this is a very quick comment. I just, I had a chance to. Oh, Roger, can you just see Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. My name's Roger Logan. Yeah, you are the expert, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a chance to hear the presentation of the the water, um, the water company report, and um, there was something either I didn't understand or, or at any rate, I wanted to make the case that it was a little bit unclear to me whether or not the land where the reservoir is was going to be part of this deal. Mm -hmm. And um, to, to, from my perspective, it's very important that it be part of that deal. And it be, it, it's very important that there not be any preconditions on that being part of the deal, that it has to remain recreational or whatever else, because it's potentially a large, a, a significant asset for the town. So I just wanted to make that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just sir, a point of clarification on that. Um, the working, the water working group uh, has no authority on what happens uh, in the town. Uh, they're group put together to kind of research the aqueduct and the status of it. They will make a report to the select board and due time. And the select board will be the one who, who takes an action going forward. Uh, so whatever the working group recommends, select board will consider, but they don't have to take the recommendations if they don't want to. Okay, is that all for citizens' reports? Hey, manager. Uh, I wish I had a more exciting uh, report with everyone here. Uh, before I get into that, I will say uh, I'm happy with the turnout today. This is great. Uh, I wish every meeting had this turnout. Um, I, I know there's a reason why most people are here, uh, but I would encourage people who are here uh, to attend meetings if you can. Uh, attend town meeting, village meeting in March. Um, the more input we have from the, the public, the better we can do as your public servants to better serve you. Uh, so anytime you can come, uh, it helps us out and helps you out in the long term. Um, with that said, uh, last night, uh, the select board uh, voted to approve the FY25 budget for the town and sewer. Uh, that will now go uh, be prepared for a town meeting in March. Uh, so we're excited for that. Um, we are aware of the current status of the roads. Uh, the unseasonably warm weather with the, with the rain has created a, a mud season uh, a few months earlier than we had expected. Uh, a crew is out working. Uh, we are severely understaffed this week, unfortunately. Uh, so they're doing the best they can. Uh, but if you have any issues, please call my office and we'll do the best to fix the road as soon as possible. Um, I want to thank the Ottaquichi Yacht Club for hosting the town hall uh, holiday party last week. Uh, they gave us a room, I uh, reserved tables for us. Uh, so I want to thank them for that. Um, and just a reminder for everyone that Town Hall will be closed uh, Christmas Day and New Year's Day, uh, 25th and the 1st of January. Uh, that's all I have in my reports. Hey, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Maybe you want us to stand. Uh, kind of, yeah. Okay. You got three feet. And I'm actually gonna. I think and because that's a mic. This right? is a microphone. Yeah. Great. So why don't you come here to share a screen? You got to join the Zoom. Yeah, I did. Oops. You need to make us presenters. I think. Nikki, can you make uh, Ben and Tesher presenters? She's on. She's on the computer. Oh. Nikki is all around, as I like to say. <laughs> Just to say both. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Nikki, are you there? Yeah, I'm working on it. Okay. It's probably the probably to find you guys. A lot of people on on the Zoom. Well, while we're figuring this uh, yeah. screen sharing out. All right, so I'm State Representative Tesha Bus. I sit on the House Education Committee. This is my first year of being in the legislature. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. All right, so um, what we're going to address tonight quickly in this um, agenda that I have, and then we'll move on to more information that Ben can share with you, is our current education fund, potential new state funding models, uh, our current enrollments, where our childcare numbers are, and recruitment opportunities. So let's start with a little bit of education about education finance. So you will see this slide. These are all of the education funding sources that we have in the state. So how we do this in the state of Vermont is that every school has a budget. That budget comes up to the state. At the state level, we look at all the revenue sources. So as you can see, it's not just your property taxes that fund education. It is also meals and rooms. It's purchase and use. It's Medicaid and lottery. It's sales and use. So whenever we start talking about taxes, even on the local level, you have to also just think about how that interacts with your property taxes when it comes to the education. So non-homestead education property tax, as you can see, it is significantly more. In 2023, 38% of the education fund came from non-homestead taxpayers. Now across the state, we set one rate for non-homestead taxpayers. And in most towns, or in more towns than not, that rate is higher than their non-homestead rate. Now here in Woodstock, it's the opposite. Our homestead rate is higher than the non-homestead rate. That does not mean that they don't contribute meaningfully, and as you can see, less than homesteaders. And why? Because our homestead rates have an income sensitivity built into them. So. If you make under a certain amount of money, you don't have to pay your full property tax bill. So that is one of those reasons, Senator. You might just d divide out non-homestead, what that income is, it's commercial and. Yes, non-homestead in the state right now is everything except for you being a primary resident of the state of Vermont. Now, Senator Clarkson worked very hard on legislation this last year that would take that non-homestead rate, which is right now just one big pot, and spread it out and give it different categories. Why is this important? Because then we could look at the differences between our nonprofits, our businesses, our second homeowners and such. So the Vermont Department of Taxes is looking at how they would create those categories right now. They'll send them back to the legislature and after the next group of people get elected, we will look at those new categories and then attach different tax rates to them. So that's what's in the mix. And it's important in a town like Woodstock when we have a lot of second homes. So please know that we're working very hard to for the unique qualities that we have in our community to help our homesteaders. So that um, is education finance. Oh. Well, the final part to that is once we look at all the revenue stream 
that helps us to create that non-homestead tax rate. And then we have a homestead tax rate, right? And it's important that we regularly assess properties because if we don't, we have to go through this correction. So if your property, like in Woodstock, is under market value, we have to bring that up to a guess of, guess of what we think is market value. And that, um, that affects our taxes as well. So if we regularly assess, do town-wide assessments, we can know whether or not that figure really is accurate. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention about our school district is we are a union public school system. And it's really important to the state of Vermont and to the budget of the state of Vermont. The state auditor put out a report that we read in House Education. Private education in the state of Vermont costs taxpayers an extra $3.8 million. That is $1 million per 1,000 children. If we had an entire state of privately educated kids, we'd be spending $80 million more on education. So I'm really proud of our community for being a union public school district. So as we look to the future of how we might fund education, how we have been funding education up until 2007 was that we gave one blanket pot of money to the school district. It was traditionally about 30%, but in a town like Woodstock, with our CLA being what it is, our, our property values, we would have likely gotten considerably less. And so as we look to this new model, we're certainly looking at the fact that we are doing construction financing in an equitized education funding system. So that means every kid in the state gets about the same amount of money to be educated. Um, that was a Supreme Court ruling. And so we want to make sure that our construction finances also um, are equitable. And so we also need to make sure that they're sustainable. So we stopped in 2007 because we couldn't afford it. And that was before the Great Recession. So what we want to do in the future is look to uh, what some other states are doing. So Rhode Island, Massachusetts, both of them had a moratorium for a while. And what they decided to do was instead of giving one big pocket of money, we would give money just to pay the principal and interest every year. And then it wouldn't be so much of a hit to the state. It would help our bonding rate for the state and it would contribute every year to the bond. Now, what we could do is also look to just help the first five years of the bond, which is the hardest for you taxpayers and me, as a taxpayer to absorb, right? So we're looking at different models like that. We will not, uh, we, we don't have that set in stone yet, but that's what this session will be about for us. You can see here, these are the priority factors that Rhode Island gave for uh, health and safety, which our building certainly has health and safety issues. Um, it, it would have uh, issues with just fire suppression systems and alarm systems, but also we're one big hallway, which would be terrifically horrible if an active shooter came in. Um, we have great uh, STEM in our school. Uh, there's also a, um, additions there for career and technical education, which we don't have. And one thing that got missed was uh, the fact that we offer great early childcare education here in our district. Um, we obviously have significant condition facilities, so we would um, hit that one. What I will also say is that as we're considering this model, everyone recognizes that there are certain people that are getting really close to shovel ready or are shovel ready for their new school. And while we're considering this, we have to look back and help them too. It won't start right when we pass the legislation. We'll go back a couple of years to make sure that, um, that we're all being considered in this meaningfully. So, as some of you know, I've been a huge child care advocate. Um, it's probably part of why I ran for being in the legislature. So I thought, you know what? In order to find out where our high school and middle school are going, let's look at see how many kids we have that are young, right? So I called all the child care centers that I've been working with. I only don't have um, official numbers from three, which is Woodstock Christian and the Waldorf School. And there is um, a daycare in Killington. So all the rest of them 
right now on their enrollment sheets have 261 kids enrolled. The wait list totaled 121. So what I did was considering there's probably some overlap because you sign up for more than one daycare, I took that down to 60. And so that means right now 320 kids need care. That doesn't include infants that are still at home with their parents. It doesn't include kids that, uh, you know, parents that don't choose to do um, pre-kindergarten at all for their kids or send them to daycare in any way. So right now that would put 64 kids in our, in every single class, if you divided that out. So then across the state, we keep hearing we have a declining birth rate and you're right, but here in this union school district, we chose to offer public pre-K. And why is that important? Those numbers right there. We are a model for the rest of the state. We have a mixed delivery system of infant to pre-K options in our community. So why did people move to our area? Why do we have more kids in our school? Because we have opportunities from infants all the way until you graduate and go to college or choose to enter the trades. So that is very unique to the state. And so you'll see in 2019, pre-K through sixth grade, 452 kids. Now in 2023, that number is 460. Now I know that that isn't a huge increase, but it is an increase. It is not a decrease. And that is very, very important. The more kids we have in our school, there's an economy of scale. It becomes less, educate, uh, less expensive to educate each kid. And so um, we have some new legislation that is being enacted right now, which has to do with waiting. Um, and I don't mean like wait in the line at the grocery store. This is... <laughs> Um, it costs more to educate certain kids than other kids. If you have special education needs, if you are learning English for the first time, um, if you have learning disabilities, so those are weighted more and the school district gets more money for those kids. So right now, the weight of pre-K was not involved in that study. And so the weight will come out and that will be beneficial to our district when that weight comes out. Because it stands to reason that right now, pre-K, you get half the amount of money to take your pre-K kid than you do to take care of a kindergartner. Maybe doesn't make sense to you. Didn't make sense to me. So I said, we need to determine an amount that is better suited to take care of a three and four year old in the school system. Now, the other thing that reduces education spending when we have public pre-K is that that kid that has that learning disability that, uh, that we can see in the public school system, right there, you have all the supports that you need educationally and also for their mental challenges or physical needs. All, the, all of that is handled in one building. Right now, if that, if that goes into lots of different other daycare centers, then those folks are traveling and we're paying them 45 minutes to travel to this town and 45 minutes to travel to that town. And I'm not saying that that we all have to have everybody in the public school system, but it is beneficial to have those kids in the public school system. And we get to know those families so we can care for their kids better. So then the next thing to mention is that we attract schools, we attract kids from 20 towns to us. We have seven in our district, but 20 towns come to us. We are becoming a nucleus. And that is with nobody doing any active recruiting. And so why are they coming to us? Well, actually, before I get to there, um, the other important thing to remember about kids coming into our district in the future is the massive development that they are doing in Killington. 250 to 300 planned units. And that could forecast to 120 students by 2030. But why are kids already coming here? Well, we have a very clear portrait of a graduate. That means that we very clearly state, these are the kinds of citizens that we wanna create for our state. We have equity, inclusion, and diversity. We have bold vision for literacy and math. So structured literacy, which is 
kind of getting um, out in the news these days, our school district led that and they have been in front of it. So we're now receiving that phonetic uh, awareness in our reading and it's made our reading scores much higher than this, the rest of the state. When the state gets to a point where they help all schools do that, it will be a big cost savings to the whole state. And uh, instead of us doing it locally, one school at a time. We have advanced placement classes. There are kids coming to us from private schools because they don't offer advanced placement, and we do. And then we have a very, very strong hockey program, other types of athletics. We've got a great theater program, and we offer excellent after-school activities. So it's really important that we uh, look at the value of our school, and we are constitutionally obligated to provide this common benefit and it is an economic driver for us. Where do our wait staff come from? Our doctors, our nurses, our teachers, they come from the kids that come up in this school district. And so now I want to uh, de-share my screen and share the screen with Ben so that he can dive a little bit further into the um, technical and financials of our district. Sure. Stop share. You are on. Oop. All right. I will get to a slide. Um, and we can get into, yeah, here we go. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. My name is Ben Ford. I'm on a uh, Woodstock representative to the school board. Uh, I recognize a lot of faces from the building tours. Thanks for, um, for double. Uh, uh, coming to double uh, on uh, this topic. Appreciate it. I'm doing it right okay. now. But you're also the treasurer. Uh, finance chair. Finance yeah. chair and vice chair. Uh, vice chair, new build chair. You wear a lot of hats. <laughs> all time. You show a little energy and they're like, yeah, you're the guy. And also, if you don't show to meetings, they tend to assign things to you. But all right. So um, I want to go through some things that are a little bit uh, just in terms of how, how does the tax rate get calculated, right? And I don't do um, I don't do this in the the, uh, the new building presentations, but this is just kind of the basics of how um, education finance comes down to the individual level in our state, right? And so the first thing you have to take is just your budget, the school budget. Um, you know, this year you'll see is going to be somewhere around $30 million for, you know, the, the entire district. And we've got, you know, five elementary schools and a uh, middle school, high school building uh, in our operations. Then there's an amount of money that gets um, rate. Tesha talked about the state education fund. That's not local revenue. That comes from Montpelier. Um, it, it's a you know, centralized source for everybody's taxes across the state. Um, but there are local revenues. There's grant funding that comes in uh, from, say, special education programs. There's tuition dollars. Uh, uh, Tesha mentioned the 92 tuition students that we get. We don't have to, uh, for every one of those tuition uh, students that we have, we don't have to uh, in include, there's an amount that we charge their sending district, around $20,000 for high school kids that reduces the amount we have to raise from our taxpayers, right? So you take those local revenues out of the equation and you get something that's called education spend. That's essentially the amount of money that we have to collect from our taxpayers, um, everybody here and then the other six towns of the district. Um, you take the education spending and you divide it by the total equalized pupils, right? That's a term of art and it essentially stands for how many students you have, right? Those, they have different weightings. So if, as Tesha explained, you have an English as a second language learner or a pre-K kid, there'll be a different uh, right, poverty, another, another factor. But you come up essentially with a, a, a calculated number, and that's how many students you have. So you divide that out, and that creates your per-pupil spend. And then the most confusing part about this whole uh, system, if you're still with me, is something called the property yield. And that's a number that the state sets every year, and it's essentially just a number – that um, is is set so that the uh, state has enough money to cover the education budgets across the state. So you take that per pupil spend, and that's efficiency is what you're talking about there, right? It's how much you want to spend divided by the uh, how many students you have. You divide it by that property yield, that figure the state puts out, and it gives you the equalized tax rate. Equalized means it's the same for every town in the district, and from there, there's an adjustment that's made for those property values that Tesha talked about. Um, the, the the difference between your appraised value in the town and then what kind of the going rate is for real estate. The, the fair market value, right, for the uh, for the properties. And that's an average. 
and that's a, a factor that gets calculated into something called the CLA that gets applied at the town level. And, and there you have it, your, your tax rate that gets applied to the, your, uh, to your tax bill. So you take your property value, uh, apply it to the town tax rate, and that's how you get it. So when we talk about, um, when we talk about a new school project, that's a very expensive endeavor, right? And if we're to, to borrow, um, and this is, uh, I know that everyone's hair is going to blow back when I uh, say this number, but with the costing exercise just got completed um, this uh, last week for the new school project. And we've seen significant escalation from what we were expecting, similar to what we see all over the state, all over the country. And the, the uh, sticker price is now $99 million for the, for the new school. Now, um, when you take that, and what I want to show you next is a model that if you've been on the new building tour, you will, and I don't want to spend a ton of time with this, um, but the, um, to show you what the impact would be on uh, the tax rate, right, of a, of a $99 million um, uh, building. And this is a little bit small, so I'll make it bigger. And I think I had to do this um, the other night when we did the building tour. But that $99 million price, if you were to, and this is another important thing, we're coming into um, fiscal year 25. We're coming into calendar year 24. The school year runs on a July to June fiscal year, right? So in July of 2024, we'll, we'll start fiscal year 2025. That's the budget that we're working on now because we're in fiscal year 2024 now. So anyway, we're working on 25, but the debt service wouldn't start for about three years. So there'll be a, a um, if the school board approves this um, bond amount, then that will go on the ballot in March, and then um, cons um, construction activities would begin. But the debt service wouldn't hit tax bills until fiscal year 2027, almost a calendar year 2028. So there's time in that schedule um, for the school district to do a few things. But let's look at the tax um, impact. And if you look at that column L, if you didn't make any adjustments or, or pull any levers, this is the percentage impact um, if, if there was, you know, no other kind of um, actions taken by the school board to correct or to, to uh, address that tax rate. An increase of 33.8% is what would be projected there. That's not affordable for, for our, our district, and we know that. And as a result, the school board has set a policy that this project cannot increase the tax rates by more than 16%. And that's essentially a 50-50 proposition to the taxpayers to say, taxpayers, you guys come up with half, the school board will figure out the other half. And we did that because we looked around the state and we saw a number of other towns attempting to um, you know, pass school bonds and they were failing all over. South Burlington failed. Um, you had uh, Slate Valley uh, failed. Um, Waterbury, what's that, Hard Grove, Hard? Harwood had one that failed. You may have heard that Stowe had one that failed, right? It's because of this model that we have. It's incredibly complex. It's also, um, if you don't do things to kind of offset that tax rate, um, th this is what you get, right? Um, is, is taxpayers who can't get behind these very important community initiatives. So what can we do as a school board to make good on that promise? The, the, the first thing is looking at just the, the shape of the, of the loan. This is 20-year money. That's kind of the standard um, that you get from the Vermont Bond Bank. There's other sources of, of funding. Killington's TIF district, for instance, they went to the USDA. They've got a rural development program. $20 million came at 3.65% interest last year. It's pretty good. You may have heard that the Fed just announced three reductions next year in the bond rate. We hope to take advantage of that. So if we can get uh, interest rate at, say, 3.5, that's what we have modeled, and then we can stretch the bond term, both the USDA and the um, and the bond bank will, will give you longer um, terms, go to 30 years. Stretching that term makes the overall project more expensive in the long run, but it keeps the tax rate low. And that's what we're trying to solve for is to keep the, the uh, because you, you think about it, it's our taxpayers are um, only one part of the equation, right? It's the overall state that, that, um, you know, that you know, pays the bill on this thing. So that 33, 34 number goes down to you know, you know, 27 there. The next thing I wanted to show in this model is how that number comes down over time. And the reason for that is because the bond is front loaded. You can see that these, these repayment amounts, um, the most expensive one is in the first year and it gets cons uh, consistently uh, less over time. That's because it's not smooth like a, like a, um, a residential mortgage is. So by the end of that bond repayment term, you're looking at something that's you know, significantly less expensive than the, than the start. And so um, like you know, about half. 
And as a result, um, you know, this becomes a relatively short-term problem. Like Tesha was talking about, the state is looking at this and saying, okay, the biggest impact is at the front. So what else can you do to, to smooth that? And there's, I've, um, that's, um, you can uh, raise money, right? Um, uh, we've presently got three and a half million dollars committed towards this project. Our year one goal is five million, right? We think with two or three uh, more years to work on it, we can probably get there. So um, I think that's pretty conservative, actually. Um, five million dollars there, and then setting an annual fundraising goal of five hundred thousand dollars. What does that do to your uh, interest rate, or the excuse me, the the impact to the taxpayer? It's getting closer, right? But the most significant thing that we can do, and this comes from the idea that um, the whole tax rate is set by that per pupil spend, is drive enrollment. And this is what we're most excited about because when we've got increasing enrollment trends at the early education levels and the ability to lean into things like Killington's development or when NESDEC, uh, the New England School Development uh, Council, looks at these kind of uh, pandemic factors and says, yeah, your school district's gonna get 120 more kids over the next 10 years. Um, you, you project that enrollment and that is um, easily the most powerful thing in the formula. If we can add um, just a kid or two a class each year, right, say 20, um, 20 students, and I've got this capped at uh, 1,200, uh, this is uh, pupils. We've currently got about 1,000, so we're looking at adding about 200 kids, um, and that would be you know, over a number of years. Um, that makes dramatic differences to the tax rate, and you can see that here. Um, you know, adding just you know, 20 kids in year one uh, would bring us you know, pretty close to that, that number, uh, so we're, that commitment of, of 16%, and then in the second year, it's coming down dramatically as a result of, of you know, that continued enrollment going up. So that's the plan. You know, it's, it's to you know, recognize the trends that we have in our community of growing enrollment, lean into those trends, build a school <laughs> building, uh, promote that, um, that enrollment, and watch the tax rates come down and down. And I wanted to show this graphically, um, this will be the last thing I do with this model, thanks for bearing with me, um, is that there's this notion that we can, you know, can do nothing, right? And it's just not true. Let me go back to this enrollment tab. The state came out with a report um, last year that had $22 million worth of immediate repairs that our facility needs, right? We saw that come home to roost in March when we had to go to bond for a $1.2 million upgrade to the heating system on the high school side. That project came in over cost because of you know, trends that we see um, with uh, inflation and, and labor shortages in the state. That project has pretty much wiped out our capital reserve, at least cut it in half, right? Now we're kind of a sitting duck in terms of future problems that we know can happen at that, in that facility. But if we take the um, enrollment trends as we've seen over the past 20 years, that is, we've lost about 220 kids over over 20 year uh, um, time span, going to down to about 2015 when those trends started to come back. Um, we can we we can get those 20 kids back, um, but you know, so, excuse me, those 200 kids back. Uh, it makes a, a massive difference in terms of the uh, the tax rate projection. And I'll do this here. Um, if you Continue with this old building, right? And we're unable to to reverse these these enrollment trends. Let's put in minus 10 kids a year, kind of like what we've seen um, over the long haul. And certainly, if you've got a building that's failing, um, doing things like having um, the sewage back up into all the bathrooms on graduation night, or having to evacuate uh, the, the school gym during basketball games because the snow load is causing scary sounds from the, the roof supports. These are all things that are happening currently in that facility. We'll continue to see kids not want to go to school there. And the, um, the tax rate will look like this. That yellow line doesn't exist. It's one that people would love to have exist, but we have an expensive building and we can't continue to um, do nothing. That's essentially, if we could afford to um, maintain that building on about $500,000 a year, which is what's in the current um, buildings and grounds budget, but that hasn't happened for a long time and it won't continue to happen. The red line there on that graph is the cost of um, what happens if we have to fix the problems that we have. That's actually only about uh, $12 million worth of the 22 that the states identified. And then we'd have to build um, a replacement facility for about, you know, uh, 400 kids, which would, is what we would be left. And that's what would happen to the tax rate, right? It's currently a dollar fifty-one per hundred dollars of home value. That's the equalized rate. It would go up to like a dollar ninety. 
Um, with a new building, you see that's the blue line. It's expensive at the start, but if you can um, absorb that initial five years and then work on driving that enrollment, it's incredibly powerful in terms of the tax rate. You're looking at over you know the same the the uh, point in time that those two lines kind of intersect is really quick. It's you'd be there within you know about five to seven years. So those are the trends that we're seeing as a school board um, for lots of reasons why we're recommending that we you know build a new facility versus trying to repair our old one and address the problems that it's got. And um, I guess that's uh, that's what I had to to share with everybody tonight. Yeah, and that first five years, that's the reason why I called the treasurer on Sunday night and said, please, please help us with those first five years. A little bit of money over the course of 30, meaningful. A little bit of money, uh, more money over the, or a, a smaller amount of money even over five years, priceless. Yeah, if you added another, if we were either, you know, able to get it from the state sometime in the next, say, those first five years, say, take that to 10 million. Or, um, you know, continue to to privately fundraise. This is what that would would look like, right? You got that. It's right in the same. I guess essentially the same range. So, and then it's really powerful. All right. Um, the board member is going to ask questions first, and we'll open it up to everybody. And they're not going in anywhere for a while. So. <laughs> right. And I just would like, to, just quickly, if I may. Um, I think all of us are under the impression, oh my God, we have to pay for this $99 million, it's huge. But actually the biggest impact on our tax rate is that is 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 the principal and interest payment. That is what is that is what will that is the, the that is the huge challenge, as Ben has said. And I think if we can figure out a state formula and figure out how to again uh, finance state construction aid for schools, which we have not done since 2007. I think we can really address that principal and interest, particularly in the first five or six years for any school that undertakes a huge construction project like this. Um, we, when we stopped funding school construction in 2007, the state, um, you know, we were beginning the great depression, uh, a, a recession of, the, of, of those years between 2007 and 2010. We had a nine year wait list. It's not like people got that money right away. If they had a school construction project, they got on a wait list. What we're hoping to do is create a funding source that will be specifically designed for school construction uh, that will go directly to that. And, and I think the smartest way we're looking at is at the Rhode, Rhode Island model that goes directly to paying principal and interest rather than construction costs per se. So I, I think if we can get to a place where we can come up with a uh, designated school construction source, financing source, how we do that is, is part of what we'll be discussing this year. Um, we will be able to nibble away, you know, to, uh, have, have people will still have to apply, school districts will still have to apply, they will still have to be reviewed, and but looking at paying for interest in principal is a lot more manageable cost to juggle than paying actually straight construction costs. The um, the uh, other thing, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, what was I going to say about state? Was there anything else on? We're looking at uh, just a, a variety of different ways to do that. Um, so we will stay tuned, but we're hoping to end up with a de you know with a a defined source for that school construction income. So <laughs> one of the Key objectives. Oh, just we're doing a, a school facilities task force this summer. The agency of education is right now. They're looking at the, you know their back backed up needs of well over a billion dollars statewide. They're looking at costs of four hundred million a year just if we. You know, I'm not quite sure what they're including in that four hundred million a year, but that is what they're we're looking at right now. I don't think we can possibly afford that as a state. So that's why I think we're going to have to come up with a, a, a formula that looks at principal and interest payments uh, and not just straight school construction costs because we'll sink ourselves otherwise. Um, ben, do you mind stop sharing your screen? Sure. Uh, sorry, for <laughs> the Zoom thing. Other thing we want to uh, have some time for the select board to ask questions yeah. before we open the public. Susan, Kerry, Susan has a question. Yes. Um, first, I wanted to just make it clear. Um, 
that we invited Representative Buss and Senator Clarkson and Mr. Ford, no relation to me, um, here to talk about education taxes and the impact of the bond. The select board as a whole takes no position on the school bond or the school construction. And I think that's important to know that we as a board have not um, voted or taken any position. And my question was that it's my understanding that presently only primary residents pay back the bond. And I'm wondering if there's any move in the legislature to change that. Uh, uh, Susan, Susan, actually the, the non-residents do pay because um, the entire cost goes up and is in, absorbed in as part of the school school the statewide school budget. So as that it, as we set the tax rate, the non-residents pay in 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 a small part. No, you're right, not as significantly as as full-time residents pay, but they do pay in in part as that tax rate is calculated by the legislature. Can I can I take a crack at that? Because I yeah. think there's a set of numbers that I, I ran that might be um, illustrative, because this is a, a pretty common misconception. Um, one of the things that Tesha talked about was when there was the school construction aid program up until 2007, that was a 30% contribution. A community like ours probably wouldn't have gotten much from that because it was means tested, right? And we're one of the wealthier towns in the state. Um, but when you think about kind of what the definition of we is, right? That is, um, are we, is we the homestead taxpayer, the people who live here primarily and vote on things? If you think of it from that perspective, and that's certainly how the state looks at it, it's the homestead taxpayer versus the non-homestead taxpayer. How much of those non-homestead taxes go towards our school budgets? And how much of it would go towards the bond? That's a set of numbers that I put together and I wanna uh, show them here. The most recent numbers um, come from a couple of years ago. Each year, the, the Vermont Department of Taxes puts out a property valuation report and they report on how much money is collected in taxes. Some of this is gonna boil your blood a little bit when you think of it from a pre-act 60 standpoint. But the numbers here, um, this is from uh, calendar year 2001. You can see that as a school district, this number here is what that, that um, education spend was, what we needed to collect from, our, our, uh, from taxes. That was $17,300,000 is what was, uh, was spent, um, to be spent that year. Um, and what was collected from the homestead taxpayer was only 12 million, you know, 300,000. So there's a $5 million gap that essentially came from the education fund, right? Now, the thing that would boil, um, would boil someone's blood is that before Act 60, this uh, non-homestead uh, contribution from the towns in our district was about $35 million, right? Amounts that those non-homestead properties were sent to the education fund. If we didn't have this kind of pooled resource, then you know we could we could build this school building you know every three years without touching the tax rate. But um, it's a good thing for the state. I think that's something that uh, we all need to bear in mind is that um, you know Act 60 has done a, a, a tremendous amount of good for a lot of communities uh, uh, everywhere, and it's a workable system. I mean, I think it's something that when um, and I guess what I wanted to um, show you is that on a percentage basis is on any given year, um, essentially the state contributes about um, on these numbers, um, nearly 30% um, comes from that education fund. And if we were to pass a bond, those non-homestead um, um, contributions, or excuse me, the, the contributions other than the homestead tax rate would be closer to 40% from the education fund. So to underscore um, Allison's point, um, it's just not true that your, your, your uh, non-homestead taxpayer doesn't contribute. Other questions from Susan or, or Terry? Terry? No, no questions from me. Um, I just had a clarifying question about the graph and um, I guess for the, for the crowd. Um, the, if the bond passes this year, the repayment wouldn't go into effect until 2027? That's correct. You could, you could even potentially delay it more depending on the construction timeline. There's some options, and those are some of the things that you know we've got a a, a full time you know business operations manager, he's incredibly experienced. This individual named Jim Fenn, who spent a career and um, you know he was the you know the um, finance head of finance at uh, Cardigan Mountain School. He spent you know 20 years in the New Hampshire system. Was um, anyway, just to say we've got people who've done school projects in the past, done solar projects in the past, and you know know how these things work and have their hands on the controls. Thank you. Um, and if we're yeah. very lucky to. Have 
And if there's a scenario where the state starts paying for the school, but with the bonds passed this year, will that be retroactive? Or is that what the thought is currently? I think it will depend on what the legislature decides. I mean, I can't imagine it would be inequitable if we didn't consider projects that had already passed. Yeah. But that line will be long because schools districts are moving ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they'll there'll be a, 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 a wait just as there was when we ended it in 2007. It took us nine years to finish paying off what we had agreed to pay, that 30%. For the schools that were in that line and had been approved, it took us nine years to pay down that school aid commitment. So shovel ready projects or projects with shovels in the ground will certainly get priority. And also, I just want to say that uh, I, you know, I, I am a small scale developer. My contractors are not even quoting these days because by the time they quote and get to the end of the project, they're losing money. They're doing it all by time and materials. So time really is of uh, an essence in a degree because prices are not trending down. I, I got a couple of questions. Sorry, sorry, I just follow up with that question. Sorry. Oh, sorry yeah. uh, with that potential funding from the state, would that be reimbursable cost? Or would that just be funding straight to the project? It will depend upon how it's constructed. Okay. Do you know where it's where so I think it, I don't think you're going to see straight construction reimbursement again. I think you will see payments to something like principal and interest, okay. which is what is the impact on our taxpayers. Okay. So I think I think that's what you'll you may end up seeing. But it is that is the big discussion I think in school finance this year in the legislature. Sorry, right. Okay. So if the bond passes and this legislation that you're talking about doesn't happen, then what happens? We have several years. I mean, uh, you did not see in Ben's figures dependence on state A. Right. So st we are very hopeful. Every school district in the state is hopeful that we will come to some uh, landing place on helping schools re renovate and build anew because we have held our breath for so long. Uh, for 15 years, really, uh, 16 years, we've been holding our breath on school construction and renovation. We held our breath on renovation. We should be, have been doing renovations on our school, I think, probably for the last 30 years, and we ha and we we haven't been. And um, so I think uh, there there is a lot of energy to coming up with a, a a a solution and a funding source in the next year or two. The, the one other thing that's driving school construction is also what's called PCBs. Don't tell, I, I cannot tell you what that polychlorinated substance is. Yes. Um, and the reason why that's so important is because if, you, if you're tested and you have a certain level of them in your school, you may have immediate action that you need to take. And that could be replacing the roof of your gym. Well, guess what? If you're going to tear your building down in three years, the last thing that you want to do is put a new roof on a building that's only going to be there for three years. So we put a moratorium on that so that we could look at school construction side by side in house ed, right. but it got stripped out in the Senate. The governor is certainly supportive of continuing this PCB testing, but it's really erratic. There's a school that was tested that, uh, they, they tested, they said, oh, you have to do some remediation. They do $150,000 worth of carbon filters. They came back and retested, it was worse. They came back and retested after that and it required immediate action. So if we don't start working on school construction, we're gonna deal with it in PCBs. And if we don't deal with it, if we deal with it in PCBs and we're doing emergency fixes, they will not be calculated, they will not be well thought out, they will be extremely expensive. So we have that huge motivating factor in the legislature. Ray, I wanted to say though, um, you know, the, this state construction aid, you know, that's essentially the model that the school district has taken with fundraising, right? To be able to pay principal and interest in those early bond payments. And if you look at the the graph, I just threw it up again. This is with state construction aid, right? In terms of all those other factors. And if you take out the you know, that contribution, take it back down to 5 million. And that's our, you know, fund, or I think what's pretty conservative fundraising estimate. It really just affects that initial period. But over the long run, you want to be on that blue line as, as soon as you can, right? Right. So, 
So, all right, um, there's a follow-up question. Um, I know you say tax rate will go down. I've never seen a tax rate go down in my life. Mm. If you if the state's getting that money, they're not going to give it up. Mm. That's interesting. So the the tax rate is based on the per pupil spend, right? So if we drive our what's within our control, we you know get the you know, get the enrollment up, um, and that per pupil spend number comes down, that's the tax rate. Our contribution is less. Now, as a school district, you're going to want. I mean, this is another thing that I think that, uh, voters need to bear in mind. One of the reasons that we set the 16% um, tax impact cap is because we have to get our school budget passed every year. If we uh, announce a tax rate increase of 30% or we don't make good on you know, promises, there's a check everybody in this room has. It's just the vote no on the school budget. And then we've got to go back and take, you know, make cuts out. So it's very much within the control, right? But similarly, um, and I bring that up to say, if, um, you know, if the school district, right, the, the school board decides, oh, we've just, you know, uh, driven all this efficiency. Why don't we give our teachers a raise or take some other, uh, do some other things that don't give that money back to the taxpayer? That's something that everybody has a, a voice in when they vote on the school budget each year. Okay. I'm going to ask for decorum in the audience. Thanks. Any, any other questions? On board, I don't think so. The rate goes down. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so I think. Uh, when we move the questions for the public, uh, again, I want to remind people to come to the podium if you're in the building, uh, introduce yourself uh, and your, uh, are we doing address as well? Uh, tap your name, your address, and um, you're gonna have three minutes and I'll let you know when you have 30 seconds okay. left. I just have one thing before, uh, we just want to make clear that we want to stay on topic talking about the impact to the stack uh, tax. Uh, and just remind everyone that the select board itself has no say over the new building. It, it's through the school committee, um, and that organization. So when it comes to kind of the whole building as a whole, the select board uh, has really no say over it. It's the school committee, which meets publicly once a month or twice a month, Ben? Uh, yeah, once a month. Oh, yeah. And if, if people have specific questions that are out of kind of bounds of that, I'm happy to stick around afterwards. You know, my in-laws just got into town. Uh, so uh, they're back mm -hmm. at the house. I'll be here all night. <laughs> okay. Just kidding, sweetie. Watch there. it. <laughs> There was, uh, there name, is. Name in. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Jerry Sachs, 34 High Street, Woodstock. Um, there was a fairly substantial group of us that have been emailing and compiling lists of questions related to the school project and tax rate and financing. And I really haven't heard uh, most of those questions answered. They were submitted to everyone sitting here. Um, were they sent to the select board? Do we no. have a municipal bond advisor? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, Let me... You started saying that the bonds would be issued through the bond bank. So then do they bear the rating of the state? That's an interesting question. Um, in terms of the rating, I mean, you're borrowing the money at the local level, right? So um, I guess it's the school district's, you know, uh, credit worthiness, but, you know, that's what you're looking at when you're borrowing the money. Okay. So if your projections say that you need 18 to 30 some percent tax rate increase, mm -hmm. what would the rating agencies say in terms of affordability of those numbers? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I I was in uni finance for 30 years. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Um, that will impact your interest rate, which will again impact the cost of the transaction, which will again impact the tax rate. Yeah, I guess I would say you can look to other communities. The, the one that we've um, been had our eye on the whole time is Burlington, who just you know last year passed their um, high school um, you know project for the second time uh, around. Uh, we patterned the the sixteen percent after the tax impacts there, right? That's that's why we set that goal. So if you're telling us that you plan to cap that at sixteen percent, but your models demonstrate that you need significantly more than that. 
how is that going to work in terms of rating or repayment? Well, um, if you get a, um, if you see a tax rate projection, I guess in, um, um, in, in, you know, um, school budgeting season that shows that the, you're going to have a tax impact higher than 16%, vote no, right, on the school budget, I guess is what I would say. In terms of the rating, these are pretty detailed questions I just don't know the answer to. But one of the levers that Ben did mention is stretching out the bond rate. So that makes the payment lower, which keeps our tax rates lower. So that was an additional a, a leveler that um, was in the presentation. Um, the three years that we don't start paying, is that capitalized interest during the construction period? Mm, I don't believe so. I guess that we need to take a look at that. Um, and there's some, you certainly know a lot more about this topic than, than I do. Maybe anybody in the room does. But, you know, it would be a good idea is to get in touch with our business operations manager, Jim Fenn. He's probably got a lot of answers okay. to the questions. But one more question. During that period, if the bond passes, despite the fact that we're not going to have to start paying, for a number of years, would it make sense to start gradually ramping the tax rate to minimize the big hits down the road? Yeah, I guess you'd have to figure out what you're going to spend that money on if you're going to increase the tax rate. Um, one of the things that's difficult, and I know, John, this is something you suggested, was um, uh, establishing a capital reserve with taxpayer dollars. The state doesn't allow you to do that. You've got to release those funds. But what we can do, and this is something that we're looking at, and I don't want to take anybody into uh, a deep dive on you know, the latest kind of legislation on, on reweighting, but there's currently like a, a five-year period, and this is a good takeaway for the, tonight, that this, uh, the state, as they've implemented new student weightings that um, what we're talking about in the models, they've established a system where there's a cap on tax rate increases at the town level of 5% for the next five years. And um, during that period, some towns like ours are kind of uh, beneficiaries of the new weighting. We, we have like more students than we, we used to um, in terms of um, you know, the, the per pupil spend. Um, we've got some capacity, tax capacity to kind of get our budget right. And what we're looking at is actually you know, paying down debt um, to um, you know, free up that tax capacity so that we can take on more um, so that you know, when the, when the uh, principal and interest payments come due, that, that we'll have less of an impact on the tax base. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, um, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I just have a quick question. Sure. Um, the other tax we've heard about, which we haven't uh, mentioned yet, is that 18 and a half percent above, that's above the 16 percent. Is that correct? Yeah. So for the, it's the potential interesting. 18 percent. Yeah, that's interesting. What, what Ray's referring to is a letter that our tax commissioner put out. Every uh, December 1st each year, there's essentially um, the state tax commissioner sets that yield amount, that property yield, and they put that out in, in a letter. And when he did it this year, he, he kind of sounded an alarm. And this is a little bit of a political game. And Allison, I don't know if you've got a perspective on this, but essentially saying, hey, if this, if, um, it, you know, a lot of it had to do with that five year tax cap because he was limited in, in where he can get, um, or, sorry, the state's limited in where he can get money from. And that's why everybody's pretty much going to be subject to that 5%, whether you're going to, You'd be you'd, you'd hit it or not based on your actual budget. Um, the eighteen and a half percent is interesting to me. I don't know exactly how it gets there because if everybody's taxes on the town level are capped at five percent, and that's on the equalized, right? And then you apply the CLA. What we have in Woodstock right now from last year is is a CLA that would add about uh, a third to the to your tax bill. Um, and that we're undervalued seventy three percent. Right. So we are not assessed at the fair market rate right so that we, we have that yeah, which is i guess what i'm saying is um if what we've seen over the last uh three years are some some significant kind of hits to everybody from that cla happening home values have gone up 50 60 percent right over through the pandemic and people pay you have to pay taxes on the fair market value of your home so the 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 impact that i've um i guess i'm just guessing at this but what i've seen is those uh, tax liabilities going up by about you know 12 percent in each of the towns of our school district each year and if that's going to happen again this year if that's what he's seeing it could be five percent plus that 12 or 13 percent is how it gets at the 18 but i'm not sure i'm not sure either but it is required by statute that he put out their prediction of what the school budgets and school construction and all the all the 
all the uh, pressures on the on the Ed Fund and what we're going to have to figure out the, what the tax rate is going to be. Our job, I mean, it is, however, incredibly premature because uh, many of you have emailed and many of you are very concerned. Uh, we're all concerned. We're all taxpayers. We're all in the same boat. So it, this this is a projection that is before the schools pass their budgets. So we don't know what the budgets are going to look like. And before the legislature gets to work and, and we do everything in our power, having served on ways and means for eight years, we do everything in our power to bring that tax rate down because we're all taxpayers and we bring in reserves. We bring in uh, all sorts of different funding you know, resources to, for us to bring that tax rate down. So it's incredibly premature and alarmist in some ways to have this uh, figure projected. However, as you know, we have some serious financial headwinds we're sailing into. Healthcare uh, for all schools has risen a, a, an enormous amount and we have to deal with that. So your school budgets will be reflecting that this year and school construction and, and, and sort of um, <clears throat> deferred maintenance for, for a long time. So those those are headwinds that we are sailing into uh, in terms of the ed education fund. I guess I would say this, and I, I put this up, or I don't know if it's of interest to anybody, but each year, and I did this last night at the school board, we don't have the final CLA numbers, those you know numbers about the fair market value of real estate in each town. But an interesting thing did happen in our school district in the town of Pomfret last year. They, they uh, completed their reappraisal. And the result of that reappraisal, you can see that where you start with that equalized tax rate of $1.51, and then the CLA gets applied. This was going into this um, current year. Um, you can see that Woodstock on the far right is at that 0.75, and that's what um, you know raises taxes by about a third is the application of that. Pomfret was scheduled to see an 18.2% increase to their um, to their you know hit to the tax rate, but they completed their reappraisal and it took their um, took their CLA number over one, and as a result, they replaced it with with these numbers, and they're really powerful. They they saw uh, you know essentially, uh, and this is the the rate you know a six per, uh, yeah I'll do what I can here a six percent um, you know decrease. decrease to the tax rate because they reappraised. Now if you're if you're a uh, you're getting your tax bill, your home is now worth a hell of a lot more because that reappraisal happened. So you're paying a far lower rate on a far higher amount. So in terms of the amount of money that you pay, you know that that may be about the same, but it's going to be um, you know different for each individual in terms of how much they may have invested in their home or how different it is compared to the you know, fair market value. You're shaking your head, Jennifer. Yeah. Oh, 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 no, 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 Jen, no. We're to have some oh, sorry, questions. sorry. I did. I'm sorry. We can. Yeah. I don't want to go be so Laura. Yeah, yeah. Zoom, please. Yeah. Uh, Lisa, your hand up. Yeah. Hi, uh, Lisa Lawler, 16 Maple Street. Can you see me? Uh, no, Not but we hear you. Okay. Um, say a couple of things. I'm sorry, my finger was there. Um, number one, I um, can say I'm disappointed that there is not enough discussion here between the school board and our state representatives about the negative impact on the taxpayers within our community. For, for if we choose to put the school, you're going to lose students. You're going to, use, you're going to lose young families. You're going to lose renters whose rents are increasing. Those children are going to leave. You can't go under the assumption that everyone's going to stay. I'm a, I'm a person on a fixed income. I can't afford this. Quite simple. Who's going to buy my house? A second homeowner. It's not going to be a family with three kids in the elementary and high school. And I feel like this issue is not being addressed by the school board or by, quite frankly, our representatives. The second thing is, is that the the village and the town have to deal with both an aqueduct and a sewer and so there is and possibly a town hall and so we are getting pushed in this limited amount of time very small amount of time to look at multiple issues and multiple information and quite frankly 
I don't feel it's transparent at all. Um, these figures are not explaining. These figures are not, I can honestly, I'll just come out and say it. I don't know anyone who's going to vote for this because nobody understands how much it's going to cost. Nobody's proven how much it's going to cost. Nobody can guarantee how much it's cost. How can you ask people to pay for water, sewer, and school? when all of these things are non-transparent. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Roger, do you wanna respond to the same Roger. Uh, Roger Logan, 40 Central Street, Woodstock. Um, on the question of the amount that goes to the state that that is not under control of the local school board, that's correct, right? That's what that's that eighteen percent figure that we're talking about. Is that correct? No. The the tax commissioner is just saying that our that our that our taxes will go up because school budgets are going to go up, and but he doesn't know that. I mean, because school budgets haven't even been passed. Okay, but some part of our income right tax goes directly to the state. It's your income tax. Your it, I'm sorry, the the property tax. We the, the uh. At, it, the equity that's in, embraced in Act 60 and 68 means that we everyone is equitably taxed on the fair market value of our real estate. We raise more in Woodstock because our grand list is so wealthy. Everything we don't need is shared with the state. Okay. Uh Everything we don't use in our school budget in a very straight, this is a very straightforward way of explaining it. Everything we don't use is shared with the state. Okay, I think going forward, I'm still confused, um, but I don't expect you to be able to enlighten me right now. Going forward, any communication about this should not just include the amount that's, that that a project like the school, the, like the new school is going to impact tax rates. It should include the totality of those tax rates and where the money is going within, whether it's for operations of the school board, whether it's for, for paying off the bond, whatever. So I think with, you know, I appreciate all the work you've done. It's incredibly complex and, and probably very comprehensive, but from a communication standpoint, it's a little bit difficult for, for somebody like me who doesn't know municipal bond rates. I need to know, are you talking about 16% plus 18% or whatever? And I'm, you know, because this, the state has said it's going to be 18%. And we can't count on, we can't count on that not being the case because we don't know how the legislatures are going to act. So I think going forward, we need a much more crisp and comprehensive look at how going ahead with this project, project or not is going to impact including whatever we send to the state from, from our property taxes. Roger, I just want to clarify that the 18% is, it, we know what the bill is once every town votes its school budget in March. We don't know what the school bill is yet. We don't know what the school funding bill is yet. We respond in March when we come back from town meeting break, we set the tax rate. It's not set yet. That was uh, that eighteen percent. You know, we have no idea what that will be. Okay, um, but was, to the best of our ability, we need to have an idea what that will be. I'm not asking anybody to have a crystal. Well, them. then we can't make an informed decision, can we? Sure, you can, uh, because what you're looking at is not the school budget. Uh, if you're going to be voting on that in March, also, but you'll also this is the you have a much clearer sense in March. Uh, of of what the bond is going to cost and what the total construction cost is going to be and what the bond is going to cost us, right? Yeah, I mean we that is, the... we'll be more certain of. And by then you'll have a passed school budget, which you'll have passed, and then it comes to us to pass the school budget as well. It'll be on the same ballot, the bond and the and the school budget. Right. Okay. And I'm 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 appreciate all the work you've done, and clearly I'm not understanding, and I don't think I'm an idiot. So I need a much clearer, I need a chart with two columns and a bottom line. Um, and otherwise I cannot make an informed decision on the information I have right now. I simply cannot. And I guess another that's a, a common, you know, thanks. I'm gonna address it, Thank yeah. Um, 
I think it's a pretty common thing. This is a very com uh, complex system that we've got, right? And that's that's uh, my intent when I when I created the chart that we put up tonight to to show you know what we're seeing in terms of the liabilities that we've got and the investments that we could make, and you know the you know the the, the trends, right? Um, so that's you know that's the best that I've been able to do so far. Um, if there are more suggestions, I'm certainly all ears. Uh, I think Susan has a comment question for. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I think, get Roger's question a little bit more clear. So for every dollar that we're taxed for education, there's a certain percentage that does not stay within our school district. And I think that's the number he was asking about for 18%. I also want to make it clear that it, we don't get to keep what we need. The state dictates how much we have to send. And I'm sure Ben and the other school members board members would love to keep a little bit more of our tax dollars and they're not given that option. So, but if you could just tell us, I think historically, how much um, of every dollar we're taxed leaves our district, that might be helpful. And that was the purpose of the chart I put up on the uh, amounts raised in homestead taxes versus non-homestead taxes, right? The, and this is, you know, FY22 for the school district that was, around 12 million against a budget of 17 million, right? And that was, and we, yeah, the, the local, the homestead taxes don't raise enough. So we're actually taking more from the state. Now, to your point, Susan, the state is all, you know, is comprised of much of our non-homestead property, our local businesses from Montvere to, you know, the Woodstock Inn to Killington Mountain. Those are all businesses that send their taxes to the state, right? That, it, before Act 60, we would have kept for our school district and we could have benefited uh, from that on a lower tax rate. But that's not the system we have. It's not the system we've had for 25 years, right? And as a result- No, I understand, but it used to be like 50-50 that you know, every dollar we need, every 50 cents we needed for our school, we had to raise a dollar. Is that still the ratio? No, I don't think that's, it's really, um, it's, I don't. I have a hard time uh, conceiving of that. I'm happy to to talk with you about that offline. But I mean, I think the simplest way is just to know that every uh, dollar raised in taxes goes to the state, and the state pays the school budgets with the education fund. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, um, I'm Patrick Kalaki, 838 Prosper Road. Um, so just a few questions. So I understood that there's a recent uh, significant increase in the cost estimate. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for your service. Sure. And this is an incredibly important issue. And, you know, uh, I'm all for investing in edu education. Um, <clears throat> so thank you um, to everyone here. Um, so, but what, what are the, what, do, do you have a, a, a clear, you know, breakdown of what the cost increases are, and, and for that matter, the overall cost of the project in, in detail and relative to options that were considered and, you know, all that, just sort of a, because this is like a, to some extent, you know, March, we're going to the market, right? We're deciding what we want to buy. Yeah. Um, so how, how does that? Yeah, we have a very clear, uh, well, actually, we went over that as a school board just last night, and there's a recording of it. If you okay. like, that'll be put up online, and you can look at it. If you'd like to look at, we went through a, a value engineering exercise, and this is a trend that you're seeing, um, you know, all over the country with the inflationary factors, right, um, that have happened in our economy over the last few years. But, and I'll, I'll give you a benchmark, the Burlington project that we look to. No, I'm actually asking for specific cost increases, like where, what? Oh, sure. In materials, labor, oh, uh, yes. hours? Yeah, it's labor, like the, the, I mean, I don't know, I can, you know, speculate as to why there's a labor shortage. I think the dump of a ton of federal money, uh, ESSER funds, right, for the school district uh, creates, creates a ton of work for, um, you know, school projects and other projects around. So the contractors can kind of charge what they want, right? Um, Burlington saw um, from the time they went to bond to the time that they got their subs locked in, they saw an almost $20 million increase um, to their um, school project. But How did you guys calculate 15 million? Calculate what? Didn't it, it went up by 15 million, I understood. Oh, right. So we started at 118 million, right? Was the initial costing that came back and we value engineered that back down um, to 99 million. Right, and that was by making reductions in the size of the facility, um, in the uh, you know, some of the materials that were used, some you know. And all that detail is available. Yes, and I can okay. actually send you the, the no no the, no problem uh, the worksheet if you like. Um, you mentioned PCBs, um, and then the concern about the uh, the having to evacuate the gym 
because of snow load creaking. What is the cost of PCBs going to be if it, if it were had to be mitigated? We wish we knew. Okay. That's a part of the reason why I couldn't support continuing that legislation. All right. You probably shouldn't say stuff like that, though, because it's um, it's a little too speculative. And when we're talking about such concrete, significant costs here, it just kind of muddles up the uh, discussion. So that so that would be not not very helpful. Um, and then um, uh, the fundraising sources. Mm -hmm. what, who who I, I like the idea of raising private funds to pay for the school. That's a very kind of like love that idea. Someone else can pay for me. But what are the sources? Because yeah, say, generally well, you don't get anything. Yeah, they're nothing. private individuals um, who, you know, like most of whom prefer to remain anonymous. I'd say, you know, wealthy. We've got a lot of wealth in our community, as I think anybody knows who's lived here for any period of time. Uh, some, um, you know, institutional funding, right? There's a huge interest in the green aspects of the project, the net zero trying to match the facility with our hockey arena, which is the first net zero hockey rink in North America, right? Okay. So a uh, million dollars in private funding is just to help reach those net zero goals. I see. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there are. Anyone online? Yeah. Uh, no one online right now. No. Okay. Is there anybody online? Nope. No. I'll call you. My name is Mark Weinstein. I live at 20 Hathorne Hill Extension in Woodstock, Vermont, and I'm a neighbor of Ben's. Well, I live above Ben. And I first went on the tour of the school back in, I believe it was December of 2019, when they start, first started offering tours of the school. And there was no doubt in my mind that seeing the school that something needed to be done. Uh, at the time, over the next intervening years, there were a number of things that were considered uh, renovating the school, renovating and adding addition, or doing a new build. That rightfully belongs to the school board to decide on what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. They chose to go ahead with a new school build. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff that I've gotten off the the Mountain Valley, the Mountain Views Supervisor Unit has all this recap information. And uh, one of the things I'm gonna bring up here, and it says spring 2001, that the schematic design was completed along with detailed project costing at about 73.5 million in 2021. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Hopefully it's, the numbers haven't changed. And I think an escalation clause was written somewhere along that time also of it 5%. Does that sound right, Ben? Not a clause. It was just an estimate that architects right. said. We and very that easy. estimate is not anywhere near close. Woefully low. If you yeah, if you go from 73.5 million to 118, it's closer to a 10%. A 10 to 15. Not more. Yeah, okay, yeah. So we don't really know. So the numbers are mind-numbing to me. They make my head spin. But I've been trying to put together as best I can. Uh, as far as the, uh, when I went on a tour, they were considering doing a bond issue in 2020 or 2021. But as Ben said, and as it said on the website, they decided to wait because of South Burlington had a $209 million bond issue. South Burlington, I believe, has an increasing school population. That school vote wasn't even close. Uh, I, I could say it's four to one, but that's meaningless. So I'm going to give you the total number of votes that were reported. 79%, uh, 6,514 6, voters voted no, 1,712 voted yes. So it was four to one margin. Uh, and what I read recently, what they've done, I was wondering what they did going forward. You have 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. What I read going forward was that it... Uh, they're putting in some sort of net zero portable classrooms. Uh, as far as the issue that Ben brought up about uh, South, about Burlington itself, yeah, 109, 210, $20 million increase in only from spring to the fall. So I find it hard, as Roger said, to believe any of the numbers that I am given. And I know most of you, and I hope Tesh and Allison will present, we're going to present more overview of Act 127, et cetera. And that's what a lot of people refer to. You can read Craig Olio's letter of November 30th, which projects the 18.5% increase. Okay. And that's why it's hard to, even though we need this, it's hard to go ahead because the numbers are gonna be way higher than everyone's predicting. And as other people said, that's it. Okay. And the other thing is I don't come to board, I don't come to board meetings because of the two and three minute thing. You can't, the school board limit us to, I stop going. I am sure people here. I know. But you guys spoke a lot more than me. Uh, we got John Spector. Yeah, John, you want to go ahead? John Spector, online. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, thanks for all the hard work. Um, I have a comment and a request. The comment is for the past 25 years, we were presented up until the last couple of years, we were presented with budgets that grew at about 3% a year, never I, rarely exceeding 3%. And um, those budgets assumed that our infrastructure, and I think the first speaker mentioned, or maybe it was Lisa Lawler ever mentioned, you know, it's not just the high school, it's the water company, it's the town hall, it's the sewer system, it's the South Woodstock sewer system. Um, the, the assumptions that we made for those 25 years of those budgets was that our infrastructure was going to last until the end of time. And I guess what we've now discovered is that the infrastructure doesn't last forever. And so as a result, obviously, if you have 3% increases for a long time and that's not sufficient to maintain things, then this is what happens. We can't avoid this. This is a, 20, this is a problem 25 years in the making. This is what happens. What we can learn from it, though, is to not make this mistake again. And so I hope that we can figure out a way to start to plan for the future, however hard that is, because these numbers seem obviously are very large. Um, the, this, the request, and I don't know if this is, I think it's a combination of the select board, the EDC perhaps, certainly the school committee at the lead, the, is to think about the recruitment a recruitment strategy. Tesha, I think when you started speaking at the beginning, you noted that our population had grown even without any effort made to recruit people. I think that's what you said. Um, yeah. the, the only thing, we, we're going to have a new high school. We might not have this one, but we're going to have a new one. We might not have it in three years because infrastructure doesn't last forever. The only, and, and that high school is gonna cost more money than we would like to pay for it. The only thing that can bring our taxes down is more people. That's the only lever that can really change these numbers. And so I would like to request that the school committee think about, in a kind of a piece of the strategy going forward, what is the strategy for school recruitment? And, you know, and again, I'm not, I'm only one vote on the EDC, but that's the kind of thing that the EDC might consider funding, because that has huge impact on our economy. So I would just request that that be built in somewhere to the strategy. I realize you have a lot of other stuff to deal with, but that's actually the one lever that we might have some control over. And it's the only lever that makes a difference. Thank you. Can I address, do we have time? Sure, yeah. yeah just, I put a slide up here. We have, uh, and thank you so much, John, for that. And we, we do think about recruitment. Um, this is a, a, a map of Vermont that shows school choice towns. Unlike a lot of states in the country, there are a number of towns in our state that have the ability to tuition kids into other school districts. And it's not a very great map. You can see Windsor County there. There are a number of towns that have school choice. The biggest one in step number one is Heartland. And I'm showing here the number of um, students that Heartland had in 2023, 142. That's more than Woodstock. They're a bigger town. That makes sense. We got five of them. If anybody who graduated from from Woodstock, you know, 20 years ago, you can think about your classmates. There were a lot more students that came from from Heartland back then. Uh, we're not we're not competing for those school choice kids like we used to. That's part of the reason why we've lost so many, right? And this is you know part of the plan is to just go to the town next door and make a pitch. Hey, would you like to come to a, a brand new high school if we can get it built, right? Um, and there are other towns, um, you know. Um, uh, Weathersfield is a big one. We've, we've pulled um, 18, you know, 19 kids out of there. That's a relatively new channel, but it's really about amplifying those pipelines that we've got in these other towns um, to, to, to beef up uh, the numbers. And that's, uh, I think it's significant as Woodstock residents to keep in mind, we're probably not going to see a lot of growth in Woodstock, but we don't have to. The tax rate is set by the contributions of all the towns in our school districts, including these developments in Killington, and also these, you know, um, school choice communities outside of our school district. Yeah, by the number of students. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Thomas. I moved to Woodstock in 1971. Um, um, myself and my now ex-wife, we rented a house for 160, two bedroom house, $160, which is, uh, wow. Um, it's ancient history. Um, but the point is that she, is now a business owner in this town, still living here. I and my my second wife are business owners and stayed in this town. We were brought here, we came here, we chose to come here, and we stayed. We were able to stay. Um, the I think I echo the the woman on Maple Street that said, 
she's on a fixed income when she sells her house a second homeowner would likely buy it and a lot of this we're talking about and is predicated on the growth of the school that we're going to add more students and i i do understand ben's point about the pipeline that we're going to hopefully get people but an awful i see i hear a lot of ifs if if we can if if you know this this will go down uh allison used the term hopeful that the legislator legislation will come up with some sort of you know legislation that will help the funding on this so i'm i remain unconvinced that we can see this you know this rise when we we were going to get tanks on the bond and having it go down i am really unconvinced and again i i appreciate the work that you folks have done and I know it's not been a six month project, it's been years, I know that. Um, and that brings me to a little second part of that, of what I wanna say is that we have been, we have seen a very professional, and I, I can't think of a better word than slick, but I, that's kind of pejorative, but a presentation about what we need for the school, the pictures of the broken clocks, and I appreciate this, the, the school has problems. and. Even the name of the meeting tonight was, you know, addressing our crumbling schools. I mean, it could have been better to say addressing funding of our school district. I mean, if I mean, I mean, to me, that's kind of a negative to come into it saying it's crumbling. I mean, but that that has been the presentation with a lot of what's been going on and with presentations to the school. What I would like to have seen, and I know that you haven't ignored the repair issue is something or someone that was able to present and put the amount of time into what a repair issue would be with a school versus a brand new school right. and i mean everyone wants a new school i mean i'd love to see a new school and I, there's a lot of things i'd like in my life but can i afford it without you know throwing a monkey wrench into the finances so i I fear that the, the, the potential tax bomb of not being able to raise the raise the enrollment of the school, and um, I, I, I remain unconvinced. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you. you want to talk about renovation versus the new bill? Yeah, I guess I, I would just say that um, the school, the architects presented three options in 2019. One was to renovate the building. Costing at that time was $51 million. The second one was to renovate and expand the school. That was $76 million in 2019 dollars. And the third was to build a new school. And at that time, it was $67 million. Uh, in addition to cost, there were also considerations about um, the program programming goals of the of the facility. Um, you know what we could potentially hope to accomplish. Um, you know, uh, and then also um, green energy goals. You know, look, uh, recognizing climate change is a significant factor. Um, the renovation option. I think if you applied the same escalators, you'd be looking at something in the you know 80 million uh, or so today to do that same project. You compare that against the 99 million dollar figure to have a whole new building. It seems to make more sense to have the new one. I also think that um, it's important to remember that the cost of renovation would not does not include the cost to relocate all those kids during the build. And I'll tell you, the cost on the kids with their mental health being displaced through COVID is significant. I ran a COVID learning school that we created right here, and we had kids with so many behavioral issues because their whole lives were completely disrupted. So we do need to look at the cost of what it will be on our children if we choose a renovation choice, because even moving them to another building, where is that? Do we bring in a bunch of trailers? What does that look like? That really has to be a huge consideration. Again, Ben, thank you for all the time and effort and work. Uh, I'm Cynthia Stevens, 76 Grove Hill Road in Woodstock. I'm just wondering, what is plan B if the bond doesn't pass? Well, as long as I stay on the school board, um, I'll try again. And could the design perhaps be um, scaled down in some way? Yeah, that was part of the exercise to bring the costing you know, down uh, that we just went through. Made a lot of uh, hard decisions, including on the building design, um, there is one of the the pods. We reduced the building size by approximately six thousand square feet, mm -hmm. right? and that was a significant cost savings. Okay. Um, you know, it's just we're up against those significant headwinds of inflation. Hopefully, we're at the end of that. 
Yeah, I mean, typically projects run over. I mean, it seems to be true in almost every project. I mean, are you foreseeing this cost going up and up? Good. We've got about $5 million in various contingencies in the project, bidding contingencies, schedule contingencies. Um, those go can break either way. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, with any luck, we'll be able to manage that pretty well. Okay. And you've got somebody on the contract? And yeah, we've got uh, PC Construction is the construction firm that was selected, and then we have an owner's representative, um, confusingly called PCI. <laughs> um, but they're actually the owner's reps on the Burlington project, so um, um, active in the state. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jared Adams, uh, 41 Pleasant Street, Woodstock. Uh, my wife and I also own the village end of Woodstock, so we're small business owners as well. Um, so first, um, I'd like to point out that the, those questions that were emailed to, I think, for the community would benefit from responses to those. Um, also, too, I just want to echo what some of the other people have saying that, you know, an 18 to 40 percent tax increase hike would hit a lot of us pretty hard. And I don't think that it would move the student numbers in the right direction. I mean, already you look around the room. I mean, we're not talking a lot of folks with, with school age children. And if the tax rate continues the way it's going, it's not going to encourage more school age families with school age children. To uh, so I think you know, that if if this comes to a vote, uh, I don't think that looking at an 18% tax increase is going to fare well. And I would encourage uh, you all to consider a more modest uh, plan. So that's well, really I think the objective is to to keep with the school construction to keep the tax rate uh, growth up to 16%. The 18% is up, is what the tax commissioner projected as the increases to our school budget this year. So they're, they're that's at, they're, they're, is they're- that on top of the state increase as well? Because then we're looking at 38% increase. Potentially. So I mean, already, I mean, already our taxes are quite high. I mean, comparative, to other states and areas tax rates. Yeah. I mean, in the, what I pay in the village of Woodstock is pretty high. Yeah, and I guess I would remind you that the equalized tax rate will be limited to 5% increase for the next five years. You'll still have the, the CLA, the property value, until the town uh, re reappraises like Pomford has, right? Um, so that's going to be the, um, the, the regular you know, budget aspect of it. And then the school project, you know, should the bond pass, you're looking at a couple, uh, two or three years before those payments would start. That's when that 16 would come in. Okay. Hey, Carol? I'm Carol Wood, live on Pomfret Road. Um, I don't see how 800 residents, give or take, are going to be able to pay for them as residential homeowners. The other thing is, I was a lister for 15 years. There's going to be a reappraisal in 25. The prices that people are paying for property is not sustainable. It's not people who are going to be living here. The numbers of students is not going to increase because there's not going to be anybody who will be able to afford to live here. They can't, and when they do the reappraisal, they can't, there's no way they can get a $299,000 house up to half a million dollars, even if they put in the new cost of construction and raise the values of the land. It just is not going to work. The numbers don't don't crunch. Just don't see it. And I don't see any increase in the population. There's no place to live now. They can build 500 units in Killington, but that's not necessarily going to be residents with kids. It just isn't. Because people aren't going to want to come all the way. You know, I, I applaud the kids that come from Killington. 
That's a long ride in a bus. And from the far end of Heartland, that'd be a long ride too. That's why we don't have people coming from Heartland in the numbers that you think would do that. 30 seconds. That's all I got. Thank, Thank you. you. I think we have one more gentleman. I just wanted, we haven't had this conversation for an hour and a half. So I don't yeah. know if we want to yeah. consider it. This be the last speaker potentially. Are you folks willing to take questions out in the hallway? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something? No, I was just going to say, Carol, the, the issue, we, it ties all together. <clears throat> our limits with, our limits to growth right now are really, uh, we are limited in how we can grow in our, in our town because of our water situation. I mean, we cannot add any more hookups right now to our, you know, to what we are hoping to do with housing. So that is, you know, that feeds into the water challenge. But we, if we are able to develop and build the housing we need to build in our downtown and village center, uh, and we can solve our water uh, problem and really have uh, a strong water supply, uh, we can grow our commercial downtown, we can grow our housing downtown, and that is the hope. But they, these things are, are all tied together in large measure. Water, our water challenge is one of our biggest, you know, right now it's a major limit to our growth. Thanks, Allison. Jason, Sorry. Bitco, 915 Carlton Hill, Woodstock. I just want to say many of the questions I heard tonight have been addressed over the last six years and are available online on the website. Just some of the, the detailed analysis. Uh, the firm that has been hired to work on this project specializes in education and school facilities, and that data is there. All the nitty gritty detail, of, you know, 80% of the questions I've heard tonight. So I encourage you, if you haven't taken the time, to go dig in and spend the time to look through that. Uh, uh, this is um, Mountain Views on the Mountain Views um, Supervisory District website. There's a whole section with all the data on this project, and it has oodles of nitty gritty data. Yeah, the FAQ is pretty good. FAQs. Um, I want to echo what John Spector said about taxes that the decision was made for us long ago. So, for people who think that there's some way to finagle our way out of higher taxes, that's a fallacy you're living under. Because this decision was made from us by this community 20, 30 years ago. We should have been reinvesting all along. And we hear this over and over again that chickens are coming home to roost. Surprise, chickens are coming home to roost. And if we don't like it, you have to make some lifestyle adjustments. It, taxes are going up. They're going up significantly. No option around it. What I want to spend my money on, my taxes are going up significantly. I want to spend my money on investments, not expenses. Foolish expenses. This project should have been gone forward four or five years ago, uh, but we dillied and dallied because of this, you know, this, no one wants to spend the money. We've, we've wasted $20 million dillying and dallying because no one anticipated COVID. And it's, if it's not COVID, it's going to be something else. So if you say, oh, wait, 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 let's look at this 100 more times, 100 more times, it's at least 5% a year. Um, enroll, and by the way, enrollment is the answer. I've, um, I run a co-working space in town, and I see lots of young families who moved here during COVID that are buying homes in town. In fact, it's more vibrant today than I've seen it in years. So I, again, I think it's a fallacy that no one will come here. Um, and remember, uh, the taxes are income sensitized, right? So, so certain people get a rebate on those taxes. That is the most sensitive family. 70% of Woodstock, uh, uh, home, home, homestead taxpayers are paying by income. Yeah, so that's that's a pretty big deal, right? So I, I don't think that's totally accurate either. It would be great to see, like, how many people actually moved young families in here. That's a great question. Uh, ben Ford said something about this 5% window that we just spent, like, 30 seconds on. And that could, I think, what you said is there's a 5% cap over the next five years. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, can we, I won't say this publicly, but can we look at loading our budget uh, for five years to get some leverage or benefit out of that that the state pays for that gives us, you know, a, a period where the state is subsidizing uh, our budget. Yeah, and the answer that, uh, yes, and that's exactly the strategy. I think I mentioned this earlier, is right. that the, the bump that we received from the waiting study we intend to use to get our budget healthy, to pay off debt, to free up tax capacity for this project. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think that's it. Um, um, 15, 
That was our last question. That was our last question, but. Okay. No, she's not on Woodstock residents. No, on Woodstock residents. Yeah. yeah. Quick question. Go ahead and come up. up. Yeah. Uh, that's, that has nothing to do with the finances. If you want to talk specifics, you can ask a specific question. Hey. I'm happy to sit with you afterwards. It's specific to finances. That's, 23 questions specific to finances and submitted them. That's that's not a question for this board. board. That's a question that you can bring up with them out in the hallway. I'm happy to stay after and go through that list with um, you. But that's not that's not a question of we're what is not a question. I'm not clear what you're saying. Well, what's your question? No, not not what's the list. You have a specific question of one of the questions that was on the list. We had 23 questions. Do, do you have a specific question you want to ask? Not the list, a specific question. We thought we were being polite, submitting them in advance. Otherwise, we would have handed them out to people to individually ask. The board has not seen these questions. That's. That's the, not, the board has not seen these questions. The we have not. Seen we haven't seen these questions, Jennifer. We do not know about the questions. So. Why haven't they seen the questions? Mm -hmm. I've seen the question. So they're going to make so time. They're going to make time. We have other other pressing issues that we have to go forward on. I think too the school committee has public meetings you need to attend and ask those questions there as well. So they, no one could have told us that in advance that that wouldn't be happening tonight. Nobody could have mentioned that to us. We submitted them a week ago. I'm not going to get into it. Uh, the board hasn't seen these. We questions. haven't seen those. We didn't know that there were questions. Um, they didn't, we didn't know they existed. So, yeah, right. That, and, there was, and yeah, so if, if you want to meet with her outside, that's fine. But we, we need to move on. So, Tasha, Ben, Allison, thank, thank you. you for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Hi, Roger. We have, yeah, yeah. thank you. I know it's hard Stay for the uh, select board meeting. The next item on our agenda. Yep. Yeah, we are. We're Thank moving. you. Yes, please do. Okay. All right. All right. Um, we're moving on with the meeting, folks. Hello, folks. Please, if you wanna, if you don't want to stay, we encourage you to stay. But if not, we, yeah. Thank you. Good. There's more. There's so much more ahead. Yeah. We've only just started the agenda. Done in the words of Karen Carpenter. Okay. Um, next. Yeah. All right, so next on the agenda. Next on the agenda is um, okay. the drug and alcohol policy. Uh, so this is from the board uh, last meeting um, with a request from the board to make some changes. Um, we asked BLCT for some guidance on those changes. 
Um, there are strong recommendations that we don't make the changes. Uh, I sent the language to the select board earlier today. Um, so I move we follow VLCT's recommendations. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if that's the case, then we can. I I agree, except for changing the word in num in paragraph four from select board as two separate words and from making it one word. Yes. Because that's consistent with the legislature and everything. Yep, we'll do that. Okay. Okay, motion, second. I'll make a motion to adopt the drug and alcohol policy as advised by VLCT. With Susan's corrections. With Susan's corrections for select Second. Board. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Um, next, errors and omissions. Uh, you have a letter from uh, the town listers, uh, something similar to what happened, I think, last meeting. Uh, in this case, a few years ago, this parcel was placed in the inactive list instead of active. Uh, we found out when uh, someone who owns the property came to look into information. Uh, we realized we did not tax them. Uh, we placed it back into the active category. Uh, there'll be tax for this year and going forward. Um, so this is just um, for the board to accept this onto the grand list. Is there a motion? I, I, I move to accept. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, I just had some questions. Is there, this is the second error and omission to the grand list in as many months. And I'm just wondering if there's any indication from the listers that this might be one of many. Um, so after this mistake, uh, it's my understanding that the listers uh, have gone through and pulled all the inactive parcels and are going through it to double check to make sure there are active. Um, I will say at this point that um, the list is our elected officials um, that are elected by the people. Uh, they do not fall under the municipal manager's purview when it comes to job performance or um, oversight. Um, so a lot of this is based on the work they do in the office um, and uh, the trust that the people that are elected are doing the right job in the office. Thank you. I'll underscore that this is, I mean, as we just worked on the budget, I'm I'm disappointed given that this number is incredibly important to how we figure out what to budget in our town and what the tax impact is. So that's all I'll say. Yeah. Uh, there, if you want to run, we're trying to use the And actually, hold on, let me close this door. Oh. Have it closed. Have it closed. Yeah. Uh, oh, that makes it loud. Yeah, but you know what? I, I think we can I, just move forward. To, yeah. We'll talk loud. Yeah. Okay. So just to be clear, does this mean we have three people doing a job with no quality control who actually impact our tax rates? Yes. yes. So is it about time that those people get trained? Do we have any, what influence do we have except voting them out? Uh, so I will say, uh, there are training available to the listers. Um, it's really up to them whether they want to get the training or not uh, by state statute. Um, we can, I can encourage them to do things, um, but at the end of the day, I can't force them where I could force the plan zoning administrator to go to a seminar or, or planning. And if he didn't, you know, set the process to terminate them. Um, when it comes to the clerk or the listers, uh, if they're elected officials under Vermont law, uh, we're very uh, limited to what we have, if any oversight. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, okay, we're we'll thinking about what we can do. Okay. okay. Um, and could I just, if I could just say for the record, but, um, there are there are listeners currently who uh, do go to trainings uh, on their own volition um, and take the job very seriously, um, and they've been working at this office for a few years uh, and so I've been here and I'm very proud of some work that they do. But just to note, this error is several years old then. Yes. Yes. Okay. Is there a motion to I'll make approve? a motion to approve this second. Into the grand list. Second? I'll second. All those second. in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion's been approved. Put the license renewal. Uh, so this is Susan Ford's favorite 
topic. Um, as always, uh, the state process is the same as it has been, uh, which I know this board finds inadequate, um, but it's the only one in place right now. So I think usually the motion is uh, to approve it under the assumption that the state's doing the due diligence on the back end. Um, but Susan, if you want this this moment to have your well, <laughs> Now I will just say that we don't actually get to see liquor license applications anymore. So I will move we approve this, um, I, I, as you stated, based on the assumption that the state is joint, doing their job to review it. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Liquor license has been approved. Mm -hmm. uh, next, uh, town hall uh, working group is a phrase we're going to use. Um, so I think in the past, there's been a few different town hall committees. Uh, they come up with different recommendations. Um, and I think the discussion last meeting was to take uh, two board members and maybe myself and kind of look at other options, take a different view from what has been done in the past um, and be able to come back to the board with something uh, hopefully useful uh, in a short time frame. Uh, but I think Laura kind of took the handle on this. I'll, I'll pass it over to her. I'm going to share my screen. I have a document that I think we can use as a jumping off point. Just give me a second. I have a new computer. I didn't go past the first two while you, while you wait. <laughs> Allows me to share. Oh my gosh. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Sorry. Apologies, apologies. You don't want to move to the next one and come back to me. Definitely. Okay. Um, Sorry. While she's working on that, you want to talk about APA? Uh, yeah. So, um, originally, the hope was to have Mark Hunter here to kind of talk uh, a little bit about some of his recommendations uh, based on just the work they had to do uh, the last 24 hours. Or so, I, I told him to go home and take a rest. Um, but for an updater, and I don't think I was just saying anything tonight, but just to kind of talk about some of the recommendations he has made. Um, originally, the board um, allocated $300,000 to Carlton Hill Road. Uh, we knew at the time that was not enough to fund the budget uh, for that project. Um, at the end of the day, that project's going to cost $371,550. Uh, that included uh, the total cost of the project was going to be $325. Uh, we had to do some tree work ahead of time. And then we had to install a new guardrail after the fact. Um, so that budget is $71,000 over budget from what the upper funds uh, originally allocated for it. So that's an option. Uh, we currently have roughly $117,000 in funds left over. Um, he also gave me a list, uh, $25,000 for a, a Cobra replacement on Benedict Road, uh, around $30,000 for guardrails on Fletcher Hill and Birkin Hill. Um, 40000 for some tree work on Northbridge Road, um, and then guardrails on Larry Curtis Road for $30,000 as well. Um, those are some of his suggestions. Uh, I don't think we need to make any decisions tonight, because uh, this work was not going to get done until right the spring anyways at this point. Um, and we have enough cash flow to cover the Colony Hill Road until a, a decision is made down the road, or we also use capital funds. Uh, a couple of reserves from that as well if need be. Uh, but I kind of just want to give that update to the board as we think about how best to allocate these funds before the next presidential election. So every time yep. Eric mentions spending, oh, Jill Davis would start. The rest uh, every time Eric mentions spending capital reserves, I get nervous. You told us a few meetings ago that we need to spend the ARPA money before it goes away. Yes. We all support that. Yes. Why on earth would we spend capital reserve money where, because ARPA can't go into capital reserve. I offer all the suggestions to the boards and let them make the decision. I just want to let them know what options are available to them. Um, they are the ones who have to do the vote at the end of the day. So I suggested the ARPA funds to them as an alternative. There are capital funds available too, if they prefer to do that as well. And why not take the vote tonight? They can, I, I, just, I just, they said they didn't have to, but. Um, yeah. It's up to it's up to them. Um, I misunderstood that. Sorry. No, uh, I mean, uh, 
if they want to vote for those seventy-one thousand dollars for the Cobble Hill Road, they can. If they want to vote for any of the other suggestions Mark gave, then we're welcome to. Mm. One of these funds, um, one of the guys. So, so currently, legally, uh, we have to. Uh, I could be wrong by a year, but allocate them by twenty twenty-four and spend by twenty twenty-five, or allocate by twenty twenty-five, spend by twenty twenty-six. Um, but there's been talk, especially on the Republican presidential side, that uh, if a Republican wins the presidency, one of the first things they do is uh, take back all the ARPA funds that have not been spent yet. Um, so there's been a real push on the local level to spend the funds before the election happens, um, because usually after the election, then there's some turmoil and what's going to happen politically. So the, 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 the guidance we're getting on, on my level is uh, allocate your and spend your ARPA funds before November. Um, how, how much do we have left in ARPA funds? Uh, roughly, unallocated? Roughly 117000 Uh There's potentially some savings from um, the fire uh, air packs, but we don't know yet. We're still trying to work out the funding there, but uh, safe to say one seventeen. So I, I'd be willing to, you know, take a vote for the 71 k for the Alton mm -hmm. Hill, um, but I'd also want to make sure that um, the fire, before we vote on giving the rest of the money to the highway, make sure the fire department doesn't need any funds. Okay. Um, so if anyone's willing to make a motion for 71 for Carlton Hill. I'd make that motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So it's like there's 71. So there's still 30 more money left. Yeah. yeah, about 40, 45,000, uh, potentially up to 50, depending on how we're going to allocate the get backs to the fire department. So once we know that. Um, yeah. When will we have them? Uh, probably the next few weeks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready with your? Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So this is, I'm going to zoom as big as I can. This is a document. Uh, I'd really like for this to be a jumping off point, and I will work in this document as we discuss. Um, but last meeting, we discussed um, moving forward with a, um, a committee that's comprised of select board members um, to move the discussion forward about town hall. And so um, that's kind of what you're looking at, and I will go through it. Um, I started with a kind of like table stakes. Um, town hall serves three purposes. It has an administrative function, civic function, um, and an arts and culture function. Um, it also has a lot of value historically due to its Asian architecture in the landscape of our town. Um, as we have heard tonight, infrastructure, failing infrastructure is a theme. <laughs> We have made no major improvements to the town hall building since 1997, and the building has several issues, um, not including but not limited to the HVAC, um, ADA accessibility, structural integrity of the envelope of the building, or of the building, and also um, envelope of the building, and then resilience against future weather events. Um, We've had two previous committees talk through options for town hall um, to find different options. Um, and in the last meeting, we decided to appoint a third committee or working group um, to find a way forward. Um, also with context, as we've discussed at length tonight, we are in the midst of several potential costly infrastructure upgrades and or purchases. Um, and you all know what they are. So, um, kind of where I started was, uh, with the objective of finding the best path forward for town hall building, um, comprising this working group of two select board members and a municipal manager. Um, this working group will, um, seek counsel from the previous two committees as needed. Those two committees did a lot of work, um, and had a, a lot of historic knowledge, a lot of detailed and important knowledge. Um, that I think we are going, I know we're going, this committee will build on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. There's a, a working timeline here. Again, I want this to be collaborative. I want people to make suggestions. 
I suggested we appoint the working group to this meeting and identify criteria we felt so comfortable, um, decide on the timeline, which again is kind of, you know, meta in that we're talking about the timeline within the timeline, um, and go from there. I also re recognize that like town meeting kind of falls into this. And so if we appoint a working group, um, town meeting days in March. Um, anyway, the idea is that this uh, group would recommend three options to the board for further investigation that meet the criteria, which I'll just get into, and then present those three options later um, with the public and invite public participation to say, like, here are the best options. We've come up with A, B, and C. What do you think? Um, and then recommend the final option before budget season. Um, in terms of evaluation criteria, um, we have the administrative aspect, which is can the space house town office um, the first committee came up with staff requirements from committee one um, that I think we can revisit and also add to as a lot of things change to work culture since COVID. Is the space accessible to the public? In terms of civic criteria, can the space accommodate public and community meetings? Does the space accommodate Pentangle offices and programming? In terms of sense of place, does it preserve Town Hall as the municipal center of Woodstock? reflecting our history, architecture, and sense of community. And lastly, but probably very importantly, is the option affordable? And I would like for us to define what affordable is um, as very many options um, have been discussed previously by both committees that kind of um, uh, range from a wide, uh, or have a wide range of costs. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd like to start with. And so I'd love to hear from other board members if they have other criteria um, and what their thoughts are on kind of the starting place. Um, I would like to have two things on a financial, affordable and practical, because affordable could be everyone working remotely, no, no town office at all and save money throughout the course of everything. But is that practical not to have a place where there's any, you know, or you know, we could have a place in, Outside of Tassville, but is that practical for someone who lives? So if we put a practical in there as well, I think that's yeah something. You want to measure that, like? I don't know yet. Okay. <laughs> but I think that's, I know it when I see yes, it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, if you go up to yep. uh, the previous slide, um, recommend the best pass forward for the town hall building. I would maybe put uh, my suggestion would be the best pass forward for the municipality. Uh, what's best for the building may not be what's best for the municipality, uh, potentially. Um, yeah. Uh, Susan has something, I think. Susan? Um, yes. My, um, first of all, Laura, thank you for this work. It's great. Um, my only thing was in the sixth bullet under what we know. Yeah. I think that the select board wanted to um, find a way forward for the functions housed at town hall, not necessarily town hall, because I think yeah. we wanted alternatives looked at. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. That's great language. No. Not, yeah, I was wondering about uh, the boards first, and then we'll go to public comment. Greg, do you have anything? Nope, I'm just mm -hmm. following along right now. Right. No, I I think um, I think it makes sense to look at something that's practical and affordable, and not just. It look. is a bit about not just looking at the building, but looking at um, alternative municipal use. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's better somewhere else. Roger. Um, Come on down. I just want to say I appreciate the tenor of this conversation. You can say your name, address, oh, I'm not sure who you are. <laughs> My name is Roger Logan. I live in Woodstock and over there. Um, I, I appreciate the tenor of this conversation and looking at it from a functional standpoint as opposed to kind of the holy building standpoint. Um, I, I, in that spirit, and, and just to, to expand on that, um, I also think it's a great idea to have the board and the municipal manager essentially make up this committee because they are not you're adjudic adjudicating competing interests then as instead of having the competing interests on the committee itself. Um, 
you'll still get yelled at, of course. But um, under affordable, I would un, under the criteria. Um, I, I would, I, I don't know quite how to put this, but affordable as uh, affordable in comparison to its value. Um, and I don't, you know, I'm, that could be much more artfully phrased, but, but they were not necessarily looking for, we're, we're looking for something that's affordable, but we're also looking for what's the most efficient and effective way for us to spend our money on this building or on potentially other buildings. So, and I'll leave it to you to craft that, but but I think it's a great start. I think it's a wonderful direction to go in. Thanks for your Thank feedback. You. I like that. I would expect to. Oh, oh, sorry, John had his phone raised first, Susie. Yeah. Sorry, no, I meant to lower my hand. Susan Ford made the point I was going to make. Okay. Okay. Um, Susie Stalls Woodstock. Um, going back to what I don't know what the guy's name who spoke, but he said that you know every year it's a five percent increase in you know, and so this is going back to way before the pandemic, and we were going through these you know exercises. Should we just like pull off the stage and make it a movie theater and you know kind of call it a day versus you know have these fancy green rooms and have all these types of things and and. and the budget is ticking up through inflation and increasing costs from this. And I think way too much time has been spent on this. We have a sewer bill, we've got a $99 million, you know, school to fund, all that other kind of stuff. Make this cheap, make this, you know, we don't, if you're gonna build a new school, we're gonna have a new theater. We've got a, a music, if you wanna have a musical theater, you've got artistry, you've got two th musical theaters in um, White River Junction. We don't need to have a stage here. Let's just cut our losses and stop spending these, you know, uh, you know, five percent increases every year by just dilly dallying, doing another committee, and coming up with another thing. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have any feedback? Yeah. No. Well, I mean, should we have? I mean, should we form the working group? One of them. Yeah. Um, working group. But then also, I mean, maybe the first task of the work where we say answer some of these questions that we have of like what is affordable like what are we yeah. talking about what is practical what is i don't know that'd be if you want to further dive into it tonight we can or if we want to make that the first task of the working group i mean i don't know it seems your, like so. making that the first task of the working group would, would be a good move forward sounds good carrie okay so the volunteers oh, i think i'm you're volunteering my Laura, you seem like a great fit. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> can you maybe Greg? Your <laughs> can you stop sharing your screen, Laura? Yep. Sorry. Anyone else want to volunteer? I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer. Yeah, I got right. nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Eric, myself, and Ray. Right. Moving on. Do we need a vote on it or no? I uh, know it's not going to be. Oh, you know, okay. It's a working group setting. We're okay. fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, discussions. So uh, this is something I brought up when I was young and naive back in probably March of last year, um, and Susan reminded me uh, last last month about it. Um, and I think it's a great idea of trying to get together um, and really put a calendar together of year over year select board. Um, agendas and when we talk about things, um, so we kind of have a set timeline of what's going to be discussed over the year instead of being a little more reactionary of what's coming in front of us. Um, so I think um, I should probably go in more detail, but if we want to, you know, have one person try to try to take a crack at it and then report back to the board with what that timeline could look like, or if we want to have another working committee, or we want to talk about kind of at another meeting of how best to put this all together, so we have. We're working towards, you know, town meeting every year. We're working towards conversations. Uh, residents know when things will be talked about, so we're going to kind of plan ahead of time. So instead of just saying, in two weeks, we're talking about the South Woodstock plant, people will know that the design concepts will be talked about in April and May of this, you know, so give everyone more, more time to look into things and, and kind of have a better idea of what a year will look like. So is that a good job of explaining that, or do you want to? No, I think that's please. great. I mean, I think I think we have big topics. Like last night, we talked about okay, in the spring, we need to talk about retention 
bonuses yet mm -hmm. it seems like that just gets kicked down and maybe in december we all of a sudden go oh no so if we look at the calendar and just plot out our biggest topics and then we know when they're coming up and the public knows when it's coming up i think that would be really helpful like the first time we'll try to somehow as a group put that together and then maybe vote even vote on it in a, in a meeting to kind of codify how we're going to talk about things i'll be my, my suggestion all right. So Something for the chair and vice chair to work on. I think that's a perfect two people. Here, here. So I, I think uh, going forward, uh, this vice chair is going to join the chair and I, and we have agenda planning. So maybe we can extend that agenda planning for the half an hour and work on putting the stuff together. Does that work for the chair and vice chair? Works for me. Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm in a really noisy hotel lobby, so I have to keep muting and unmuting. That's Sorry. Right. Uh, so I'd like to make sure that <laughs> Teal Davis, Woodstock, I'd just like to make sure that in early January, the water is on your agenda. I think uh, Kerry knows the timetable, um, Eric knows the timetable, but as the Finance Committee, we were presented with a document that you should all be reading now and you'll be getting more recommendations on January the 8th. And if the recommendation is to buy the water company, and if we want that to go on the bond vote, it has to go on by January the 8th, 18th or 19th. I haven't have confirmed yet, but yeah. But about that time. So there's very little choice. And I think a meeting needs to be scheduled and the public needs to know. And what we did tonight, uh, might be helpful for the water as well, but it needs to be scheduled now because January has a habit of disappearing. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it was always the intention of the water working group to present their findings to the board. Uh, I think we just had some to go to the finance committee first and not, and we would chose the finance committee first, so we'll bring it to the board next. But thank you, Joe. That's point well taken. Uh, the discussion of nonprofits. Um, yeah, so I got, uh, so for those who's unfamiliar, um, a few weeks ago now, um, we had all the nonprofits who uh, traditionally receive money out of the town budget. Uh, they came in front of the board, kind of talked about uh, where the money is, what is used for, what they, the good they give to the community. Um, I thought it was a great opportunity for them to kind of let people know what they actually do, and for the board and the residents to find out where the where the money goes. Um, and it's my recommendation we kind of make this a yearly uh, tradition, um, and maybe have them back after March, the March vote to kind of really dig down to how the money's gonna be used going forward and the expectations the board's gonna have of them each year that if they're gonna be continuing to come and have money that's not really on a petition, that's what the board kind of wants from them to present so we have an understanding of how that money is gonna be used. Um, and it's, it's my long-term goal that the board would then, you know, be voting on some of these petitions and articles ahead of time to show whether they support them or not for the residents. Um, so that can be a longer term uh, solution. Um, but I think we had a discussion of how we wanted to look and what we want uh, feedback maybe from a few weeks ago uh, from the board itself. So maybe we include it in the um, the joint meeting that we did the pre budget meeting when we had department heads. Yep. So we asked them to present the way department heads do. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's perfect. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. Roger. Um, Roger Logan. <laughs> wherever the hell this is. Um, I, again, I really applaud this initiative. I would like to see um, if for, for those organizations for whom it, it's relevant that we had add some revenue, um, how they might be able to, some revenue considerations in those discussions with these groups, how do they have capacity to raise revenues in other ways than the town budget? Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Thanks. Of which stock? I think that's me. Right. Yeah. You. So we've had several meetings of the self. And, and Greg, please chime in if I'm saying anything incorrectly, because we're both on the committee. We've had several meetings of the um, what we're calling South Woodstock Wastewater Design Committee. I 
I can't say we've made a lot of progress. We've reached out to numerous architects, none of whom are interested in helping. Um, I think we're still waiting to hear from a landscape architect. We kind of have figured out what we can't do as far as plantings and things like that. Um, the one positive, hopeful positive thing is the Vermont State College in Randolph, um, formerly VTC, may be interested this spring in putting it out to their architectural students to see if they can come up with something, which would be a cost-free um, idea swapping thing, I guess, you know, just to see, get some fresh ideas. You know, right now, you know, we're, we've come up with painting, siding, and planting. Our goal is to have several um, ideas and come to the public uh, for input on what might work there. Any questions? Or what Greg, did I forget? was a uh, fence covering. Um, Slats? No, like a whole canvas that uh, is made by a fence company that's to cover up all the chain links. Uh, a design, a camouflage, if you will. There, there was some uh, samples there that uh, Mr. Pickett had. Um, and one other thought that uh, Jeff and Tracy Holmes had, or Jeff Holmes had, was making the uh, fence small around it. Um, the fence incorporates like the whole area. Parking lot too, right? What's that? The parking lot as well. Yeah. yeah. And Jeff had some ideas because he watched them plow on it and it was a nightmare. Um, but they incorporated the whole generator and everything. So one thought was possibly making that smaller, which would make the whole facility look a little smaller and just fence in the generator. Yeah. Um, which I looked at it the other day and I'm like, yeah. So anyway, that was the only other thing. And I should add that one of our um, one of our agenda items has been and will continue to be fundraising. I think that um, South Woodstock is interested in funding as, as much, if not all, of any improvement among our residents so that it doesn't um, get taxed on the wastewater users or the general taxpayers. And when are you guys meeting next? We have our next meeting in January, not until January. I don't have my calendar, sorry. I don't have the exact date. January 4th, I think you said. Thank you. Somebody said. And the, I just want to clarify, the making the fence smaller isn't, is just making the fenceable area smaller. It's not Correct. lowering. Yes, not, not make the size height any less, just okay. the area. And I assume the original fence was there for security? Yes, yes. so in a liability, um, the last key one is, Someone trying to climb up the tank right. and get in, yeah. Okay. That comes from the engineer. Which, which that, seems uh, like something so many people would want to do. Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Is that it? That's yeah. all I have. Okay. All right. Tom meeting, bro. Yep, so this is an ongoing our article uh, discussion for the group considering, uh, as we talked about earlier, before we know it's going to be March. Uh, so I know Laura wanted to discuss uh, a few things uh, today, so I'll kind of turn it over to... I'm going to share my screen again. All right, guys. <laughs> I had hoped everyone would stick around for this part. Um, okay. Sorry. We're talking about town meeting day, Susie. Um, so I'll give a little background. Uh, first, which is that Charlie, our town clerk, found a ordinance from 1981 uh, that stated that town meeting should have all measures except for officers voted on the floor, um, which we have not been following. Um, Does that mean we can get a tax rebate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, the Vermont State Legislature enacted Act 1, which allows the legislative body of a town, that would be the select board, to vote on applying Australian ballots to town meeting. Um, it's a COVID measure that extends through June of this year. Um, and as we know, last year we saw historically low turnout at town meeting day, Saturday, which is when we had the floor vote for um, special articles um, and, and certain measures. 
um, that was about, actually it was less than 3%. Um, so I have, it's been kind of talked about as we've been prepping for town meeting, um, what options there are for town meeting day given this information. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of lay out the options um, and discuss. Um, so if we, um, if, if we want things to remain unchanged for this year, we can follow the 1981 ordinance and the public can vote every article on the floor and officers by Australian ballot. We could also follow the ordinance and include an article to apply Australian ballot to town meeting day moving forward. So that would start in 2025. If we wanted to change how we vote, um, which there has been some interest in, thus prompting this document, um, we could have a special public meeting before town meeting day to vote to apply Australian ballot to town meeting day moving forward, which is something that Comfort and Reading have done in recent past because they actually saw um, numbers less than 10% uh, voter turnout and they were inspired to change how they did that. Um, or we could vote to use this act to apply Australian ballot to this town meeting day and then also have the option moving <coughs> forward. So I know that's a lot of um, ifs and, and ands, but uh, yeah, I was hoping to put this in front of the board and see if anybody wanted to discuss um, the merits of any one of these. So if we put it on Australian ballot this year under the COVID, old COVID rules, um, it still has to be on an article, so has to be voted on by the public. So that would be an option if we wanted to move Australian ballot moving forward after this March 2024, we would need to include it as a measure okay. on the ballot. That's 4A, yes. But this year you've done that. This year, if we wanted to apply it just for this year, the select board could vote to say, we want to use Australian ballot for this town meeting 2024, period. Can you? Does that mean that anything you voted on, we're going to spend money, we can vote on it in, in the ballot? Yep. Every. Everything. Everything. Susie, can you come to the... Susie Sulls, Woodstock. Um, it's incredibly important that you do that because there's a lot of people who are working and they don't have childcare, they can get out, you know, to, to, to vote quickly. I've seen people bring their babies and their dogs into the, to, to vote, but they can't do that at town meeting. Really, really important that you do this. So another important thing, and I'm really glad you brought it up, uh, or you reminded me rather, which is that if we do change to Australian ballot, we're still required by law to have the informational meeting, which is kind of where we talk about things within 10 days of voting via Australian ballot. So we would still, we could still have the Saturday meeting that everybody knows and loves, where everybody gets to flange the select board and, uh, and then vote um, via paper on Tuesday. I mean, I love that format. Uh, and we've done that before. It can be voted on the next Tuesday. So we have the meeting on Saturday and it can be voting on Tuesday. Never been a problem. Um, so I have a, a technical question. Sure. Are we allowed to, irrespective of the COVID rules, would we be allowed in the future after this year to follow that same format of having the votes on the Australian ballot and the informational meeting. Is that something the town can act on? So that would be 4A. Okay. No, um, that right. looks a good idea. So that would be if we could enact this act one, we, I have no idea if the legislature is gonna enact something similar this year that says like, we still believe right. the rules. But given what we know now, we could use that act to decide as a select board, we want Australian ballot. And then we could put on the ballot this year that we want this moving forward. Um, and so, so that's that's something that has to go before the public. That that decision. Okay. Well, they would vote on the ballot. Okay. But the Act One enables the select board, the legislative body, to make the decision without a. Just for this year. Just for, for this, this year. year. Right for this year, I understand. Okay, so ideally, that is exactly how I would like to go forward: is to say, let's use that the Act Twenty One or whatever it is. Act one um, to do everything, to have the informational meeting and then have everything on the Australian ballot. 
I'm afraid that it's late to start that conversation because there's going to be a lot of screaming and yelling about that. Um, there's a lot of people with a sentimental attachment to standing around in a room. Um, they're still going to have still going to be able to do that. Oh, but they can't vote. There's nothing to vote on, right? Oh, 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 yeah. just, but, but, so, well, they will so get to vote on whether they want to do that going forward. Yeah. yeah. Right. So that's, that's, but that would, would that be on the Australian ballot or would that be in town meeting? It would be on the Australian ballot, but we could talk about it in town meeting, but they wouldn't vote on I it. I mean, again, I think this is the ideal thing. I just think you need to think about the communication strategy for this because it's going to be, I, I think a lot of people are going to be great. And I think there's going to be some people who start screaming and yelling about what happened to, you know, the people's democracy or something or other like that. So again, I would, I would be delighted to go forward with it. I just want it to work and I don't want people to start sabotaging it essentially. I understand. Um, yeah. As we have it right now, it's like very convoluted because the, if we follow the ordinance, we are voting on the floor and also by paper. It is inherently inefficient. Oh, we're doing both. Yes. Yes. But that's just for the, the, the paper would be just the position. It's just the officers. Officers. So which is going to be a huge change that nobody's going to understand either. Right. So I, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So <laughs> I just, I, and I would be happy to help with this, but the communication strategy on this is going to be really critical. And it needs to start tomorrow if you're, if you're going to make, the, I don't know if you can make this decision tonight or not. But whenever you make the decision, it really needs to well, start then. We have to make it tonight because the ballot have to be ready. I would hesitate to make it. We didn't prioritize that we're going to have this vote. Uh, we have three, four people in the audience. People were unaware that was going to be brought up. So th um, this wasn't on the agenda? It was just it's under, only on the agenda. Yeah. It was under town meeting prep as discussions. Uh, to be okay. fair, well, then I. The five I would, people I would in the move. audience are are more than more of a, than the percentage of Woodstock citizens who went to the last town meeting. There was a snowstorm. Go ahead, Carrie. Huh? Well, then I would just okay, go ahead and move. We put this. Okay. I'm just going to say that I think they should, we should wrap it up tonight and then put this on the agenda clearly for the next meeting. I'm very much in favor of option four and four A. Um, but you know we need to get a little bit more public buy-in. So, uh, it's before Jill goes, if I was there, we'd probably want a special meeting. Or uh, next meeting's the third week of January, which is right around the deadline of so we can do all this happening. So I, I, I think I think it seems like we're going to need a, a meeting like the first week of January anyway, or you know first or second yeah. week in January for a couple issues. So, okay. So, so Jill, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, um, so I'm Jill, I live in Woodstock, and I just wanted to represent the represent the viewpoint of the people who enjoy town meeting and see it as part of Vermont and enjoyed that part of coming to Vermont where you can speak and get involved in your local politics, which doesn't happen in cities. Um, so I'm completely mixed. I don't like the idea that everything is done from the floor if we've been doing it illegally. Have you checked that? That's best our knowledge, that's what it's had, yeah. So with that knowledge, I think 4A is a great idea, but I just want to express the regret of somebody who's enjoyed town meetings and think it's very important to Vermont. And I would uh, wish that you treat this sensitively because there'll be many people who I think think like me. Can I, yeah, can I ask a clarifying question? Is it, the, is it the, the debate and conversation and information sharing or is it the voting part of town meeting? It's the fact that the people who come to the meeting take part in a debate, listen and understand, and then vote, rather than just turning up on Tuesday without having done any history, any homework at all. Okay. So um, it, it makes sense to have a, a meeting, a special meeting for this. I think we should do that because I would rather go with, I, I, I I never figured out why we didn't do everything on the Australian ballot since I moved here. Okay. It just gives all these, everyone at work, it gives families time. And, you know, most families are doing something on Saturday with their kids nowadays. So, um, we can, you want to try and come up with a date now? 
Tuesday in January. I mean, it doesn't have to be a Tuesday. It can be, you know, um, I'm going to say something out loud. I'm going to regret saying it out loud. But I don't know if we want to tie it into a conversation with the working group for the water company as well. The eighth? Uh, well, the, the eighth is when they are, what's, what was it? That's our next finance committee meeting, right? Yeah. Okay. Wow. yeah. Well, I think that makes good logical sense. I mean, if we yeah, we're kill right. two birds with one stone, one yeah. Yeah. I don't want to sit through two meetings like that. So let's just do it in one. Yeah. 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 Um, so we can do it. I mean, we do that Monday. I think the ninth Tuesday would be the trustees. That's the second Tuesday of the month. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we could do that Monday night after the finance committee meets second finance, time. We finance do... committee meets at what time? 1230. Yeah, you know, that works. You want to do it at night? I don't have my calendar, sorry. You want to do it after the finance committee meeting? Well, we should do it at night if we want people to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Six 6.30? 6. 5.30? I think 6. Earlier the better. It's great, whatever. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You want, right, you want 5.30? Can you do 5.30? Always Susan. I said to the EDC. I don't have my calendar, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, well, do we? It's five thirty on the eighth. Good for the four people besides Susan, so we at least have a quorum. It's fine yeah. with me, right? Yeah, I right. guess so. I don't have my calendar in front of me. So we tend to say that if Susan can't make it, we can either see what we want to do at that point. Oh, they can yeah. zoom in too. Yeah, I think Jeffrey's got his hand up. Um, no, I've I've taken my, I took my hand down. I think it is a very sensitive issue, though. And uh, boy, I, whew, it's very emotional actually for people who've enjoyed not only doing the debate and actually taking the vote. I'm, I'm just worried that we're gonna end up with uh, people not being informed, not showing up for the information meeting eventually. And it, it just becomes very strange uh, to just do it on Tuesday. But uh, anyway, uh, I think it's important to have the public well informed about this. So that's all. Agree. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, what time was five thirty? Five thirty. Yeah. I, I would the board want someone to maybe write something for the Vermont Standard about this? Uh, I know the holiday. A lot does not want to do it. I can see she's avoiding. Me. Um, I'll do it. Um, I could do it, but it's just going to say. If you're interested in an Australian ballot, come to the meeting. Um, man of many words. Man of many. Um, it does. It can, it can be anyone. Um, for uh, area brief or uh, the view from here or like something to the standards that we can okay. get the word out there that this is what the board's thinking of and the board wants to advocate for why they want to do this. I, I, that might be a good way to get the conversation going. Yeah. Okay. I'll I work. would recommend the list serve as well. Yeah. 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 I would volunteer, but the Cole Ford household is overextended. We cannot. Oh, uh, she looks nice, Carrie. I think you have a lot of free time on your hands. Yeah. <laughs> it's the one thing. Oh, no. That's good. All right. I'll do it. All right. Uh, so continuing how me and prep, uh, the board has to kind of start making a decision on what they want or anything to advocate on the um, articles for a town meeting. Uh, there was a discussion last night about the 1% Option. option tax. Um, if there's anything else that the board wants to talk about, or we should probably be ready to have that decision by the special meeting on January 8th, yeah. so we can again prep for, it, but also then communicate outreach. You know, the public know what we're thinking and why. So um, I think we needed to define infrastructure. Yeah. If we wanted yeah. to use the one percent. Yes, yeah, so the first mark. Yeah. Uh, and how that would the process would go out if. We talked about just infrastructure, if it's split between potentially water, sewer, um, infrastructure, um, and then how the process would go going forward of spending that money, if it would have to come in front of the board, if it would be the missile manager's authority, how the board would want that um, to, to work out as well. Um, I would advocate that it would go to some capital reserve for infrastructure or whatever, but that any expenditure would have to come in front of the board uh, before anything was spent. Um, would be my recommendation because you want to make sure that I trust this board and hope the board trusts me, but who knows, we'll be here in 10, 15 years. So. Well, we put that on the agenda for the 
And I'll have about what infrastructure oh. means to us, you know, when a little discussion, I don't know if anyone. Maybe we can look at, um, I was just gonna say if other, yeah, the definitions that are maybe standard to use and I guess what, yeah, what are we trying to achieve with the definition or what are we trying to exclude with the definition? Is the Cause question. I mean, this scenario, if we say infrastructure and I come to you and say, well, this town hall building is infrastructure. I want you use money for that. Is that really what we're talking about when we say infrastructure? Or are we talking about roads, plants, um, pipes? You know, what is actually infrastructure? Computer systems? Yeah. So I think we have to we have to be sure we're careful of what we of how the definition is. Yeah. But if if we could structure it in a way that it's still coming for the board for the expenditure. Approval. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I kind of like. Oh, go ahead, Susan. No, you go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'm just looking at some some definitions that I'm finding um, online. You know, basic physical and organizational structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society or enterprise. If that if it falls under that umbrella and has to come before the board, I don't see that that's bad. Yeah, good one. I think that that Susie Stills Woodstock. I think that um, there's a lot of trauma in the in the town right now with all of these mandatory upgrades. And I think a really good idea would be to say, we're going to use that 1% for these mandatory upgrades. It would just, I think, you know, like the new school, like the mandatory stuff that we have to do. So can I ask a clarifying question? Yeah. You want to specify it within the fund, mm -hmm. like maybe say like this much goes to X. Or to say that, you know, initially or whatever, you know, it's going to go to like the, the new school if that passes or like the state mandated stuff that we have to do. Like there's state mandated stuff, that, money that we have to spend. Mm -hmm. And it's very traumatic for the people who are like, you've heard that and you're going to hear a lot more about that. And so if you were to say, we're instituting this 1% to help, you know, soften the blow of these state mandated expenses. I think you're going to get, I think people are going to feel good about that. You're going to feel like you're trying. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I'm Jill from Woodstock. So just to follow on from that, it won't feel good. And the, and the option tax might not pass if you include things like trees, vehicles, things that we don't have to have. So supporting Susan. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe we work on the definition yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can work on the definition. Roger. Uh, can I just say something about the town meeting in general? Are you finished with the- No, so tell me in prep, come on up. Um, as I have promised in the past, I'm not going to stand up and say we want a 10% cut on the entire budget. Um, but I do think it would be very useful for for people to, to and I, I don't know how you do this exactly. It's a tough thing to do, but to explain where we are with budgeting mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of taking care and and planning for the future and where we would expect to be in the next year and the following year and then where we could start to potentially be identifying efficiencies and savings so that we're not always incrementally growing our budget based on what we did last year. And I know you're not at that point now, but I think it would be useful if the board or, or you could stand up and, and discuss that. So people have a sense that there's progress being made in that direction. Thanks. Thank you. That's great feedback. Anything else for uh, meeting prep? Um, not really, no, but I think just uh, make sure the board can think independently about what they want to put on as articles and so we can work on that. Last but not least. The easy one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the sewer ordinance discussion. Um, so uh, we talked about this a lot already, uh, but I want to, you know, keep the conversation going um, and kind of just give a timeline um, of where we're at. Um, so the current sewer ordinance uh, states that um, any expenditures, capital or day to day, are paid by the the users, the sewer users. Um, we have the 
$20 million uh, renovation for the wastewater plant, um, ideally on schedule for a vote in November. Um, but as we all know on this board, um, the first second point is gonna be who pays that $20 million for the plant. Um, the way the board would change the ordinance if that was the appetite of the board would be uh, to have a discussion about what, how the language would change. Then we'd have to come back with the ordinance written out in that way and which the board would then take a vote on. If that vote was successful, um, it would be about 60 days before it would go into potentially into effect. So we're talking about really at least two meetings uh, and then two months after that. Um, and after that second meeting where if the, vote, if the vote is successful and there is a change, we can start then advocating for the next step of the plant, but we have to get to the point where we know what we're going to do with the ordinance if there's going to be a change or not before we can really start trying to sell this project because the first front everyone's going to say is how much am I going to pay? And if we can't answer that question, uh, then we're not going to have that plant renovated and we'll be paying fines from the state pretty soon. Um, so I know this is a difficult conversation and a difficult decision for the board. Um, I was not here for South Woodstock, but I watched meetings. Um, but I really think it's something we have to start working on you know, as Roger said yesterday, uh, with all this stuff, because if we don't, we're going to find ourselves in the middle of summer without a decision, and then, you know, we're going to be in trouble come up, come November. Um, so I don't know how the board wants to navigate this first step, um, but we have to we have to take a step. Um, is what I'm saying tonight. Well, I think we need to have, have for, for this is going to have to be special meetings. I think the only item on the agenda. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, to change the ordinance, are, are we, are the options before us changing the ordinance with like, with actual specific language over who pays or, or non-specific language? I think Susan had suggested, maybe I'm wrong, I'm calling wrong, non-specific language to change the ordinance so that we could then enable the conversation. Like the users pay except in cases of, um, just the extraordinary events. Extraordinary yeah. events. Mm -hmm. Does that get us to where we need to be, or does it need to be the users pay? And, and I mean, I guess I, I'd put a question back to you. If you're a non-sewer user, a user, and we go and say uh, the ordinance now states that sewer mm -hmm. users pay except for extraordinary events, your question is going to be What's what extraordinary? and how much they have to pay. So I mean, we can change the ordinance just to have if we want to have some cover but we can talk about the ordinance of changing it at the same time. So it, we can make the change Susan suggested, but it's not gonna, I think, placate anyone. And if I'm wrong, tell me, the three people in the audience, four people, if, if, that, if that would give you a better sense of what's gonna happen with it, with this plan. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I wasn't asking so much in terms of placating as much as just like a process question. Um, and maybe Susan has a thought about that. Yeah, uh, Susan, you're first and Roger will go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the first step is changing the ordinance so that we can have the discussion. And, um, and, and once the ordinance is changed, my recommendation would be a working committee with a, a septic and a sewer. And I know we did that before and it wasn't necessarily successful and there were a lot of reasons for that. And I think it's worth giving that a try, but doing it quickly. Um, you know, it, it is going to be a little difficult not knowing the exact number of the bond that's going to be requested in November, but I think that we can at least get that that discussion started. But I, I I just don't think we can I don't think we can change the ordinance to be specific. I think we need to change the ordinance in a general sense, and then that will enable us to go forward with the more specific discussion. What are you saying? Change the ordinance to say we're going to discuss it? No, she's saying change it to say users pay except in extraordinary circumstances, okay. and that being the first step, and then outlining what the specific options are for okay. possibly I'm, I'm cost sharing. Just the extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, so this, I, this is, you know, this being the first extraordinary circumstance that we've really faced since the plant was built. I understand what Susan's point of view, and it's it's perfectly logical and probably legal. <laughs> um, I think it would be very hard to present this as an abstraction 
that we're changing the language so that under extraordinary circumstances defined as as you know a 20 million dollar bond issue or however you want to define that and that users would pay 75 percent and and mm -hmm and non-users would pay 25% or whatever formula you come up with. But I think not at least having a sense of what those formulas might end up being, it's going to be very hard for people who don't spend as much time watching you guys work um, as I do to really understand what they're voting on. Um, you know, people want to paragraph about what they're voting on. So I don't know exactly how the legal machinations would work on this, but I would suggest that you get it as specific as possible before you actually legislate it, because then it's just gonna be, it's, I mean, it's, there's always gonna be a screaming match. And my thinking has evolved on this, um, and I know other people's thinking has evolved on this, but, but it's still gonna be, one group against another group if and and it will continue to be but i think we could mitigate it to some extent by being very clear on exactly what we're talking about susan can i ask a clarifying question from you up here you're on mute sorry susan i wanted to follow up as well so but you can yeah, ask you go me first, then I'll, then I'll ask the clarifying oh, question. so you know i certainly think we have to go into a bond vote with telling people exactly how any how it's going to be apportioned. Um, I don't think we can actually do that kind of math until we know what the bond is going to be. I mean, in my mind, the math is you look at the cost of paying back the bond over the 30 years and, and you have to somehow acknowledge that people on septic systems are going to face a considerable expense in replacing their septic system during that same time period. That's, that's my opinion, just my opinion. And I think it's just a matter of math, but unless you know what that bond is going to be, you can't do that math. So that's why I keep saying the first step is change the ordinance so the math can be done, but certainly you wouldn't expect anyone to vote on the bond vote without knowing um, what a suggested allocation is going to be or what we what the select board has decided the allocation is gonna be. What, if I could clarify, I think what Susan's saying is that changing the ordinance is not the end result, but a step in the process so that we get to the end result of clarifying the math. And so my clear question is, we make that change the ordinance you're talking about, and then do we make another change the ordinance when we yeah. know what the allocation is going to be, or it's just... No, I think the ordinance says that the select board can make a decision if, if there's an extraordinary circumstance. And then, you know, because we don't want to tie a select okay, board so 20 years that, from now into doing the same thing. So that's the part I was missing. So you, the, it would say that users pay for everything unless the select board agrees it's a, a certain situation, in which case they can reallocate the way things are paid for based on a vote by them in a public meeting. So something like that. Right. And okay, then the okay, vote is still... And then it would go to special vote, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, I think at the second point, sorry. I have two questions. One is we've been, um, there's been lots of uh, instances where the vote, you know, where the paying has been split. Mary talked about a bunch of precedences where it was 80, 20, sometimes 70, 30. And they only found one precedent where it was only users paid. That was in 1986. So why do we need to change the ordinance now when we've been funding it this way? you know, at least back since the, for 40 years. You know, so I mean? there's an ordinance from 2006 um, that states our uh, article nine, section three, uh, the rents and receipts of the use of such wastewater collector and treatment system shall be used and applied to pay the interest and principal of the sewer system bonds of such municipality, as well as the expenses of maintenance and operation of the sewer system. So in 2000, so what you're saying is that in 2006, so we haven't had a, a vote bond to fund this uh, since 2006, and it was changed in 2006. I don't know if it was changed, but this was the ordinance from 2006, and, but the South Woods ordinance, song. There was another ordinance that Mary pulled up that was... From 1986, it was signed by three yeah. people. That said this, had the same language, because I yeah. checked. Okay. But the South Woodstock plan is currently only paid by 
still use still it. Still use yeah, it. Yeah, following that for that following that language. So that's so your automatic. So that's why you need to have the ordinance. Okay, thank you. And then the other question I have is, I've read the ordinance. I don't know whether it's in this particular one as well, but that you could charge like up to three percent additional for. Uh, you could charge sewer users up to three percent additional for future upgrades and management and stuff like that. Are we doing that? Um, I'd have to look at the numbers. Um, this year, there's a on a reserve fund. Uh, I think it's only ten thousand um, dollars. I believe there was a uh, contingency fund at some point. I don't think we've been funding it uh, the last few years. Um, so my guess is probably not. But I want to confirm before I said that one with hundred percent conviction. As a sewer user, I really would love for you to do that. I mean, if we've been doing that for the past 40 years, they wouldn't be as looking at, you know, wouldn't be no. half it, but it would it would count. I mean, every little bit counts. So please yeah. do that. Yeah, that's one of my goals too. Okay. So are we voting on that? Uh, no, because we need to have the language in the ordinance okay. that we vote on. So I think we can put that in there. We're running by um, a lawyer. Yeah, and make sure that's okay, and then we can have a meeting to vote on it. Oh, Jeffrey. Yeah, but sorry, Jeffrey, you end up. Yeah, I, I did. Um, I think it's a little odd to have such an unspecified change to the ordinance because what's without any definition of an extraordinary circumstance. Um, and I think it's very important to have a, a meeting just on this topic even though, you know, there will be obviously two different points of view or multiple points of view. But I think people really need to express themselves once again, as they did for South Woodstock before Mary just stopped everything suddenly and said, oh, wait a minute, there's uh, something that people didn't understand about that. And I, I have a little bit of problem with Susan's point of view about her septic system, because she doesn't pay the monthly fee that sewer users do and if you add those fee or those that yearly fee which by the month that yearly fee it adds up over time to be what a septic system person would do need to maintain their system so i really think it's extremely important that this something of this scope be borne by the entire community um, but that's that's my point of view but i think a lot of other people have that point of view as well it's just too big uh, with all of the other things that have been discussed tonight, it's the school, the aqueduct company, uh, to uh, have it borne by a small number of, of, of residents. Uh, so important that we all get feedback. Uh, and I think a, me a meeting is important. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah. I, think, I think we all understand that we need public feedback in this meeting, which is why we're going to warn it, but that this is a first step towards that and that this is not the final result right. and that there are going to be many discussions about how the costs and if they are shared and what they look like. So I just, Roger, if you could keep your comments. Yeah, no, I'm just saying that I think I think this is a good approach. Um, the, the language of the ordinance that Susan is talking about needs to be crystal clear and and you all need to be crystal clear about what the implications of that language are. So it's obviously going to be a loud meeting. <laughs> Susan, do you want to comment? Yeah, the only thing I wanted, well, two things I wanted to say is I, it, it's a little unusual to me, but when we were discussing the sewer, but I don't know, it was before I was on the select board, but so four years ago, maybe, um, no one seemed to know about this ordinance that is signed by five select board members, which does say it's, it's user pay. And, and so the fact that Mary came up with something that was drafted in the 80s is now kind of irrelevant. Um, and so I, I wanna thank Eric for <laughs> giving us something that we didn't have at the, at the time. And I also note that a lot of this ordinance is now um, defunct because the state has taken over permitting and enforcement and everything of all septic systems, including people on sewer. So it, it, it's an ordinance that has to be modified in more than just um, the way we've been talking about tonight, but perhaps that's um, for another time when we have more time. Thank you. All right. So we pretty much pulled that. All right. Oh. Uh, nope, nope, no, not, not yet. Before it ends tonight, Susan Fuller, South Woodstock, and this is back to the Australian ballot thing. Um, 
since I've lived here in Woodstock, basically from 67 on, uh, we always used to originally have a Tuesday. It was a, Everything was closed on Tuesday. It was sort of like a national holiday, and everybody came to the town, and then they voted. And it sort of changed around to a Saturday, and not so many people showed up, and part of the Australian ballot, half of it was that. Why don't we think about, just out of the box, think about the possibility of taking that Saturday, if that's the day that people, and doing the Australian ballot the same day, so people would come and just be able to be in a discussion if they didn't know about it, pick up a ballot, go through and vote. Just that way you might get more turnout. Thank you. Great suggestion, thank you. Thank you, Other business? Yeah. Approval of the minutes. Uh, so Susan had one comment on the 1121 minutes um, that the approval of the agenda process would include the chair sending out the uh, draft agenda for um, comments. So we'll make that change on the um, minutes, but also on the um, agenda booklet that we're putting together. Okay. okay. All right. Motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion. Second. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. And good night.